This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to a sunset safari drive all the way from South Africa in the Greater Kruger National Park. Just look what a great start and especially for all the kids in Diamond Springs Elementary School and the Rivers Bend Goddard School, you're some of the luckiest kids today because we have started with cheetahs who are on a kill and my name is David and the camera is Senzo. That's how Senzo says good morning and he says good afternoon like this. So we're very lucky to have cheetahs with us and remember kids request your teachers to ask questions on your behalf. Any questions, any comments, any feelings are very welcome. We are three of us out here to show you a lot and to educate you about animals in Africa. Myself, another gentleman called Steve, and another gentleman called Raf. Now let's go back to the cheetahs because you're the luckiest kids to start seeing cheetahs on a kill. We got different cats in Africa. We got cheetahs, we got leopards. And now these cheetahs here, it's one mother and her two babies. Cheetah babies, we call them cubs. C-U-B-S. And it's one mother with her two babies and they are feeding on an antelope. For those of you who might be a bit screamish, you may choose not to watch now and maybe face on the side and for those who are courageous enough, you can continue enjoying the meal here that's being, you know, the cheetahs are eating. And they're eating an antelope that is called impala. We've got different types of impalas, of antelopes in Africa. This particular one is called impala. And if you look carefully on the left of your screen, you can see a horn, which means this was a male impala. We just found it when they were eating it. We are not sure how it was killed, but most likely these cubs look big and maybe they might have, have helped their mother to kill it or bring it down. Isn't that exciting, kids, to see that? So remember, as I told you, ask us as many questions as you can. And fantastic here. Everybody's excited to see the cheetahs. And we are have some nice temperatures here of about 77 degrees Fahrenheit and 25 degrees Celsius. At one point during the drive today, please let me know what temperatures you have there back home in school. Cheetahs, you might confuse them to another type of a cat called a leopard, but we'll be explaining to you later on why they are different. We got my friend called Raf, who would like to say hello to all of you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome aboard the Sunset Safari, and welcome especially to the Rivers Bend and the Diamond Springs schools. I hope you are ready for a wonderful afternoon, and we will be expecting all of your questions through your teacher, and ask those questions away, because uh, I just want you to re remember that you must go one at a time, and because that's very important, and then we'll answer your questions about all the animals out here in the African bush. We're in South Africa. Do you know where that is? I'd like you to have a look on the map. Where is South Africa? And what animals do we get here? Well, we get elephants and lions and buffalo, and we also get some kudu and impala. And that's what we're looking at at the moment. And you see that Impala that's over there, that's, well, that's a kudu that we're looking at now, but uh, David was showing you an, an impala that had been killed by a cheetah. So these are a little bit different to that, so they uh, get a, quite a bit bigger than impala, and so it would be quite difficult for a cheetah to be able to catch these guys, but uh, they go for something a little bit smaller, like maybe a little young one like that.
would be able to be taken down by a cheetah, but we don't want them to all get eaten. They need to also survive for themselves. Look how cute he is, hey? That's a little young one. We've got lots of stripes. It looks a little bit like Bambi, doesn't it? And they all just eating a little bit at the moment, eating some grass, eating some leaves. And that's what a kudu will do. Now, the boy kudu has got big horns, and the girls don't have any horns. But, well, we can't see any of them at the moment, so maybe I need to go a little bit forward so we can get a better view on them. But I'll just wait. Oh, there's... Who's that? That's a little bird. That's the cousin of Zazu. Zazu is the yellow-billed hornbill, but this is a red-billed hornbill. And what's he doing? Looks like he's feeding on some berries or maybe some little ants or termites. I would say maybe termites. See how he's shaking his head around like that? I'm sure he's eating an insect. Would you think he's pretty or is he ugly? I'm, I'm going to say he's very pretty, but you might say he's ugly. He looks a little bit funny, doesn't he? But they are very good flyers. And they like to go on the ground and catch all sorts of little things. Look how he's jumping around. Wow. And so this little bird is jumping around on his feet. And, well, he's not the only one jumping around. I know somebody else that's out on foot. His name is Steve. What an absolutely cracking start to the afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Cheetah on Juma, right next to the lodge. Herbie, or my name is Steve Falkenbridge, I'm joined on camera by, by Craig, um, and Herbert Causa, our phenomenal tracker and assistant on these drives, is back with us, and he came running from Gallagher Lodge to tell us that a cheetah had killed uh, Impala or Nyala just outside of camp. So you should have seen David's eyes light up when I told him. Maybe you should go there. <laughs> he was very excited, and I'm sure you saw that excitement come through. If the other gentlemen have not told you, this is an interactive safari. Please join us live with the comments on the chat stream or hashtag safari live on Twitter. Let us know what you'd like to see. Uh, Ralph is in the west following up on tracks. Uh, Brent Leah Smith was here earlier, and he said that the tracks of a female leopard were on top of his vehicle tracks as he was leaving. So we're quite keen to go follow up on that. I know Ralph is in the area as well, but it might need some off-roading capabilities. So with Herbie, Craig and myself, we're going to be moving into that area to see if we can have any luck. And by the sounds of it and the location, we can assume that it is a Shadulu female, the young three-and-a-half or four-year-old female that we have in the area. And it could be very exciting. But while we try and make head or tail of these tracks, David Gitu is, I'm sure, extremely excited where he is. Right, kids, just look at what we still have here, and these cheetahs are still having, I would call it, uh, their late lunch, because it's about uh, 3 o'clock here, Central Africa time, and it's a mother and her two cubs, and you see how clever the mother is? She maybe did all the hunting, and now she steps aside and allows the cubs to eat fast. It's just like how your mother would make some nice meal in general, Mothers will want to serve their children because mothers are very good. They eat fast and then the parents or the mothers can eat later. So what that one is doing now, as they eat, they might have other animals which might smell this food and they might want to come and steal the food from them. I'm talking of animals like hyenas. Hyenas are also types of predators and predators are animals that hunt other animals. So they'll eat stop look around and make sure there's nobody who is coming to steal their meal so you can see they have started with the back part because it's a bit soft and then gradually they'll go towards the intestines and the stomach contents so they start with the soft parts because it's easy to eat and if an enemy or a predator will come and steal the food from them they'll have eaten enough amount I was talking earlier of the differences of or another cat that is similar to what you're seeing now these are cheetahs and this other cat is called the leopard so if you look on the faces of these 
cheetahs which are eating here, they got two black lines from the eyes to the mouth. Leopards do not have that. So that's one major difference between these two cats. And the other difference would be cheetahs have like what you call spots. If you look on the body of that one, it have like spots. And leopards have like rosettes, like big, like semi-circle dots. Now looking carefully on the neck of it, you can see it's a bit fluffy. And that tells you she is a young one. As they get older, that fur or that fluffiness will disappear. Then back to lunch again. So kids, I'm sure you know, your teachers will tell you of all the animals in the world and more so here in Africa, cheetahs are the fastest. Granny Peck think the cheetah was pretty close to camp and it's true because it took us only five minutes to find this kill. It was so, so close to camp. Can you believe it? And this shows you how the world could be good when you respect the animals and the animals respect us. They can come so close to where we are and we do not interfere with them and also they don't interfere with us. That shows you the relationship between man and animals can also be very good. But that would only happen if we remain in the car and not when walking, like when I step out now, it will be totally different. So if you hear any calls or any sounds now, it will be either from monkeys or squirrels or birds that are scared or afraid of these cheetahs. And that is the mother now, slowly coming back. And you can see she's a bit bloody, she's got a bit of blood on her cheeks, which means she could have eaten, or when she was trying or killing this male impala, she got a bit of blood. But just look how attentive she is. So she is looking to make sure there's no hyena, for example, that would come and snatch the food from her babies or from her cubs. Isn't she a good mother? And once she allows them to eat for some time, she'll also step in and also eat something. But she's such a good mother, she has been allowing the cubs to eat. And now one cub moves aside, very respectful kid and now she's eating with the other cub. So babies of cheetahs and leopards and lions are called cubs. And you can tell they must have been very hungry. So one thing cheetahs will do, they will have to eat very quickly. Unlike the leopard I was talking about, if a leopard makes a kill, more often than not, it will take its food up a tree. It will drag it all the way up. But cheetahs will always eat on the ground. And the key, your question is, what are cheetahs' favorite food to eat? One, it depends on where they are, the habitat or the home area or the home range they are. But for example, where we are now, they'll bring down antelopes and more so impalas, antelopes of that size, like an impala. And if they go for bigger antelopes, for example, different ones that we call the kudu, they will go for the babies. But they don't go for the very big ones unless it is three fully grown cheetahs or four. But I would say here where we are, they have always been going for impalas because impalas are not big. They are big just like them, but the favorite food around this area is our are impalas. Different areas, they could be going for different antelopes. For There's one that's called the Thompson gazelle or the Grand gazelle. So this particular one, remember, I told you, is called the Impala. Connor, how do they run so fast to catch animals? Cheetahs, once, if you see, if you're going to see the mother standing up again, you're going to see around the ribcage area, her ribcage, her ribcage area is so big, which means she, she also got big lungs and cheetahs have been designed to run very fast. And because they have big lungs, they can run very fast because the lungs can hold 
a lot of oxygen. So you and me and all the animals, when we run, we burn oxygen. So the cheetahs can keep running for a long time because they have big rib cage, which have big lungs, to hold more oxygen to burn as they run. So remember, they're the fastest animals in the world, the cheetahs. They can do about 100 kilometers per hour. I would like to know how fast you run. Mrs. Scratcher, you asking, do babies drink milk or they just eat meat? Once young, before they mature, the first thing they'll be fed on will be milk until they are weaned. And about, say, 10 weeks, they'll be able to start eating meat slowly, slowly, which will be introduced by their mother. And then they'll be having milk and meat. And then at one point, they'll stop, you know, they'll be weaned, stop eating meat stop eat, taking milk and just eat meat only and after about one and a half years they'll be full, fully grown they'll be dependent and they can hunt small prey for themselves and then the mother will tell them goodbye and they'll go separate ways that's about one and a half years that's the period they live together with their parents if you can hear some alarm calls behind us those are monkeys Now, do you see those monkeys? They're the ones that are making the calls. And Johnny, your question is, when do they hunt? In general, cheetahs will hunt during the day because they see better. And at night, they will rest and they'll get a place either to move a bit or just sleep. But cheetahs will always hunt during the day and not at night. So what you saw there, if you're hearing any noise in the background, those are the monkeys that are making those calls, and those monkeys are called velvet monkeys. Yes, that's exactly, and that's a velvet monkey. It may look a bit blue between its hind legs because it is a male. You're so lucky, so he is feeling a bit uncomfortable because he is feeling worried of the cheetah there because cheetahs could easily also run for them. So he's trying to intimidate them. Just look at that. So this is called a velvet monkey. And they were in a group, and all of them are trying to intimidate the cheetahs. Get out of here, get out of here. But the cheetahs are not intimidated. Yes, see where they are? Monkeys are very agile, and we see the arboreal. That one has a baby, Do you see that one has a baby? And they use, they have like claws on their toes, and they jump on the tree and they climb slowly, slowly until they get to the top. And the same way, they'll come down. When they're on top of the tree, they can jump from one branch to another. I just want to talk on my radio for one second, and I'll be right back. station to you welcome to the Jeta sighting all alone let's find out Steve Ovo who is on the walk whether he has any news for you well you're back with us on walk and we have managed to come into the area with those tracks now Brent was 100% correct in saying that there were some fresh tracks here but what he was incorrect in saying that these were leopard tracks this is in fact the tracks of the cheetah that have come in and what's quite noticeable about cheetah tracks is, first of all, um, the negative space inside the track. Very hard for me to hold it. Let me just turn the torch on like that. There we go. How's that, Craig? Is that working? Okay, so the negative space, I'm talking about this patch over here, is very enlarged. You can see how it's standing up very, very high. In a leopard track, that's not so pronounced. And also, it seems as if this track has been put in a little bit of a vice grip and it's gone and it's been kind of squashed just a little bit, especially the back pad. The back pad is very squashed, and um, so a leopard track is a little bit more round, where this one is seemingly quite long versus wide. And uh, that's quite easy to see for a cheetah, but at a quick glance from a vehicle, and he wouldn't have been in a, in a game drive vehicle, he's probably in, he was just in his personal vehicle, so good on him. He saw the tracks, 
and he probably was not thinking there's cheetah around because there's not n normally many cheetah. Sort of at a quick glance, yes, it looks very, very similar to a leopard track. But uh, with investigation and with uh, Herbie and myself come to the conclusion, most definitely cheetah. And there's more than one, as Craig will show you, all along the side of the road here, they have been playing. So it's definitely mum with her two youngsters enjoying a little bit of fun before they hunted that poor unsuspecting Nyala. So marvellous indeed. At a quick glance, Impala Ram, I'm terribly sorry. I've obviously misunderstood the rest of the communications. But if I have a look here again, you can have a look here. Look at that negative space I'm talking about there. See how high that bulge is in the middle. Very, very high. You won't get that in a leopard track. Their, their feet are a little bit more more flatter. You do get the negative space, but it doesn't stand out as pronounced as that. And here is a much smaller, whoopsie, much smaller track. I'm trying to get my torch to work. I'm terribly sorry. Well, it seems my torch has given up the ghost, but there is an animal out there that likes to follow animals like cheetah that make kills, waiting for some scraps. Well, look at this. This is a very big bird and a bird that we call a vulture because they like to go down and they might actually see the cheetah eating that impala that David is with and then they'll go and wait in the tree just above the cheetah and they'll wait there until the cheetah leave the the rest of the meat and they'll go down and eat some of it so they really help to clean up uh, all the leftovers that um, the cheetah might leave so it's very interesting but they don't look very pretty do they they're quite ugly looking birds but they are very important for helping to clean up all the smelly bits and pieces of meat that left, get left behind and this one is sitting on its nest so it's not going to fly off any time soon I don't think and it's just relaxing high up in the tree far away from anyone so none of the other animals will be able to get to it only other birds would be able to fly up there maybe a leopard will be able to climb up the tree but uh, it's very high up the top of the tree so that leopard would have to be very careful if he wants to go all the way up there. And he's got very good eyesight, does a vulture. He can see very far. And he'll probably even be able to see all the way to where uh, David is with the cheetah right now. Imagine you could see that far. It would be amazing. It's like having binoculars for eyes. Wow. And you see his very sharp bill, the beak in front. That is so that he can cut the meat when he's uh, going down to uh, the animal lying on the ground. Now, Mrs. Potter, I'm, I don't know if there's any babies in the nest right now. I think there might just be some eggs. So we'll wait and see and... I'm sure it won't be long and we'll be able to see some little babies but uh, they've got to be kept nice and warm like a chicken on its eggs they need to keep those eggs nice and warm and then eventually the little chicks will break out through the eggshell and then we'll see the little babies but um, nice and high up off the ground so those little chicks will be very safe and out of harm's way all the way up at the top of the tree there and then mommy and daddy will fly off and go and collect some meat and they'll bring it back and they'll open their mouth and um, and the little chicks will f eat the food straight out of their mouth. So that's very interesting, isn't it? And well, speaking of the cheetah and the meat on the ground, let's go back to Rafiki Dave and have a look at that. 
yes, keep walking there, and there's a lot that could happen out there on walk. And these cheetahs, you can tell kids, they're still very hungry and they're not stopping to eat. They've been eating all through, and one of them just stepped on the side from where we are. And Janice, that's a very good question. You notice in all the cats we have in Africa, the cheetahs, the females tend to live alone. And the males will only be together with the females for mating. And once they make the babies, they go separate ways. Anytime you'd see, say, two fully grown cheetahs, if it's not a male and a female, you might see two brothers living together. So males always live away and the females always live away. So you'll get, sometimes you might even see three cheetahs together fully grown, even there have been known to be five forming a company or what we call a coalition. So males dance are difficult to see like that. I mean, they're easy to see, but they always be away from the females. So once they finish mating and they will give birth, males go their way, and the female is left to give birth to the cubs and take care of them until they grow, and the female will stay with these young ones for about three, four months, and then they'll stop breastfeeding or taking the milk from the mother, and then they'll be used to eating meat, and they'll be going hunting sometimes together with the mother. And as I said earlier, at about a year and a half, they'll be dependent and they can hunt on their own. But out also on the safari, we always see males, one on his own or two, as I say, together as two brothers. Makia, how many sports does a cheetah have? And that is the most difficult question you have asked or have heard this year. Makia, I have to be very honest. It's very difficult to know, but what should happen? Every cheetah is different from the other. So unless you get one so closely, but you can always have a count and, you know, make a guess. But I would say for now, Makia, they have so many sports, but I have no idea how many cheetahs, how many sports a cheetah would have. So you see now, it's the cubs that are eating, and the mother is on the left. Marco, good question. Depends on whether it's the young ones or the fully grown ones. But I think these young ones here, I can see them eating about, uh, give or take about 500 pounds, you know, of uh, meat for the young ones. And the fully grown one, it could even eat a kilo to two kilos in one sitting. But the young ones, maybe half a kilo, especially when they're very hungry. And you, can, you notice now they're struggling to get to the internal uh, organs of the stomach and they'll use some two special tea they got called canine. If you look carefully when they open their mouth, you'll see they got two teeth that are bigger than the rest of their teeth, and those are called the canine teeth, like what you have, but for the cats, they are always bigger than the rest of the teeth. So these two young cubs are the ones that have been eating, and I just learned from my friend, they were born in October last year, I hope that's correct. And if that's the case, I would assume they could be going to about uh, eight months now or so. So they could be roughly about eight months. Mrs. Carter, how are you today? And that's a very good question. How many babies can a cheetah have? This one I learned also from my co-guide that initially it had four. It lost one, I think, to lions, and then unfortunately it lost another one to a snake bite. So she's got only two surviving. But a cheetah can even have up to eight cubs. There's one that was recorded that had 10 cubs together. So anything four to 10, it is very possible for cheetahs to have. The only challenge is when they have more than eight, cheetahs have eight teats or four pairs of uh, the mama glands. So if they have more than eight, it will be like if eight of them decide to nurse together and they have 10, two may have to eight. So cheetahs have about eight teats 
like so eight could be a good number but more than eight it could be a bit tricky for the mother cheetah if all of them will want to come asking for food at the same time so 10 has been recorded once uh, that was in East Africa and I was not very sure about that there's one also that had about 12 cubs and 10 survived of the 12 You notice the mother is still very good. She's allowing the cubs to keep eating and she's just watching the cubs and you know, see, that's the mother there, enjoying her good hard hand work and seeing her cubs or her babies eating. Saturn, good question. What do monkeys eat? Monkeys will eat a lot and monkeys so you might have seen a fence there and uh, other friends of ours who are staying the camp close to where we are. That monkey, for example, is what I was telling you before, is called the vavet monkey. And monkeys are omnivorous. Omnivorous means they eat both meat and any green matter. Green matter, I'm talking of vegetables. So it could be eating the leaves. You see it picking some points there? Can you see that? So that exactly answers your question. So they'll pick ponds, they'll pick leaves, and once they come down from the tree, you'll see them sometimes eating grasshoppers or some different types of insect or even beetles. So monkeys are omnivores. But the cheetahs we have here, we can say they are carnivores. Carnivores meaning they only eat meat. Michaela, you're asking why do the monkeys have a long tail? They have been designed or they have evolved or grown like that by Mother Nature, but occasionally we have seen them when they play on top of the trees, they'll coil their tails on the trees or the branches when they want to jump from one branch to another. That's what their tail would use, they would use it for, or when they're walking, they would put it right up and they would follow each other using the tail. Isn't that interesting to see all the monkeys up there and the cheetahs down there eating? So the monkeys are eating up there and cheetahs down there. Now, Rick, you're asking how far can the monkeys jump? A monkey can comfortably jump, say, up to five or ten yards, five or ten meters, depending whether it's jumping from one branch to the other or from the tree, uh, from upper tree to the ground. And if they're being threatened or they're scared of something, they'll always jump to make sure they're safe. If they get chased, you have another type of monkey that's called the baboon monkey, which are much bigger than this. And if you see baboons chasing these monkeys, they always run and climb trees. As much as baboons can do the same, but by climbing trees, it helps them to run away from the would-be predators or the would-be enemies of them. So exciting. That's the fence I was telling you. We are not very far from a camp near us and this cheetah is so close to that camp and that's why you see a fence on the other side. So the camp is on the other side and those who are guests in that camp. London, you're asking if the cheetah's teeth are sharp and how do they rip the meat? Because once they start eating meat, they will definitely do that when they have the teeth and their teeth are very sharp and that's why they are able to rip the meat because before the mother tells them goodbye and they go live their own life the mother has to be sure they have the right uh, they have strong teeth to be able to feed for themselves so you can see the mother is still worried not worried per se but she is looking to see if an animal like a hyena could smell this food because if a hyena does that she will come right here and is going to steal this food from these cheetahs hopefully that does not happen before they get full this is so exciting and now you can see they're getting so close to the stomach contents
Jeremiah, that's a good question. How big can cheetahs get? I would say a full-grown cheetah, Jeremiah, a full-grown cheetah could be about 120 pounds. That's a male, 120 pounds. And a female could be, say, 90 or 100 pounds. Yeah, 90 or 100 pounds, Jeremiah. That's a fully-grown female. Males in the cats world if you look at all the cats cheetahs lions leopards the males are always bigger than the females so jeremiah a male just see how they're dragging the kill there i think they're changing position and they're going to a different table but the males yeah are always bigger and for cheetahs they could be 100 or 120 pounds and the females could be 90 up to 100 pounds How exotic is this? Now you can see the black tear marks I was talking about, and all cheetahs have the black tear marks, while leopards do not have that. And most likely they were thinking either to have a drink, but they'll all pause and look to make sure it is safe. They're not worried of the monkeys now, but their biggest concern, even apart from the hyenas, is other predators or other cats, like leopards or lions. If lions also smell this, they will come and snatch the food away from them, or leopards might also do the same. So we'll always have predators competing with each other. So definitely these cubs are enjoying They might also have a little bit of a pause before they continue eating. Senzo, do you want us to change the position? Madeline, it's a good question. And you'd want to know, are the cheetah spots on the skin or on the fur? They are all on the fur. If you look carefully, they are all on the fur. If you shave it, you might end up missing all those spots. They are all on the fur. But like the black tear marks you see there, is right on the skin. So either they may want to have a bit of a rest before they continue enjoying their meal, Isn't this wonderful? So I'm going to change the position a little bit so that we can see better. Just give me a few seconds. Move forward. What do you think, Susanzo? Let me give you a different angle so that you can see better. And let's go to Steve, who is on a tree. Yes, we do have a tree, and the reason why we're looking at this tree, it's a very big tree, is to compare the differences between what a leopard will do compared to the cheetah that you are looking at busy eating the meat now. And the cheetah don't take their kills up trees, and then they lose them. And what we have here is what a leopard did, and the remains of a leopard kill. And you can see the fur of this impala that fell out of the tree, but most of the meat was eaten. But it means that the leopard can climb up the tree, feed on the kill, and can spend days, days there on their own with no worry of vultures or lions or hyena or anything else coming and stealing their food from them. So it's a very good strategy. And that's what makes them very successful hunters. And when we look here, I've managed to find some fur because just like the, the cheetah, the leopard will also pluck the fur out of the skin of the animal before eating the meat because it gets in the teeth and it's not very nice to eat it's all very very bad in the mouth and to go into the tummy so leopards and cheetah they do have time to pluck it out before feeding on the meat so very very sort of nice sign when looking for leopards so I'm gonna go back over to Ralph who seems to have found a very pretty bird Well, look at this. We are sitting looking at a little kingfisher. Now, normally kingfishers eat fish, but this one doesn't. He eats insects, and he's called a brown hooded kingfisher because of the little brown uh, almost hat that he has on. But look how red his beak is and very sharp as well. That helps him to catch the insects that he feeds on. And you see how his very pretty wings as well? A very nice color of blue. And he's sitting there on the branch looking for any insects that might be flying around. Oh, he just had a little poo. 
Well, that's normal. Everybody has to eat and everybody has to poo. So we don't need to worry about that. And look at him. I'm sure he's, he's trying his best to see where a little insect might be flying so that he can swoop down and catch him. And then they sometimes bash them on a branch to make sure that they don't sting them. And then they'll swallow them down. See how he opened his bowl there? Now, Sutton, they are called kingfishers because normally these little birds, they like to catch fish in the little rivers and ponds, but not all of them catch fish like this one. He doesn't catch fish at all. He normally goes just for insects, but his cousins, they all like to catch fish and they'll fly down from a branch like this one is sitting on and then they plop in the water and they catch fish under the water and then they'll fly up to the same branch and then bash the fish on the branch until it's dead and then they need to swallow it head first. So this little one, he doesn't do that with fish, but he does it with insects, exactly the same like his cousins. Jordan, his tail is blue because it's like if you've got brown eyes or blue eyes or, uh, you know, if you've got blonde hair or brown hair or black hair, this little guy, he has a blue tail and that's what makes him uh, special. So he is a brown hooded kingfisher. A very, very pretty little bird sitting on a branch all by himself. He doesn't like hunting together with other birds. He likes to hunt all alone, very much like fishermen. Don't you know? Fishermen like going fishing alone, don't they? So that it's very quiet and they can catch lots of fish. Right, look at him. He's also just fixing his feathers so that he can fly nice and well when he needs to. You see, he's always looking for a little insect. And so he's a, a very small little hunter, and we call that a predator. But, well, there are some bigger predators out here, and David, as you know, is sitting with some. Yes, I'm still doing with predators and kids, as I told you, predators are animals that will hunt other animals. That's what a predator is. But even small animals like spiders, when they hunt other animals or insects, we might also call them predators. But for our purpose of where we are today, let's say just the cheetahs that are our predators for today. And again, such a good mother. And you see now, the cubs are still digging in because they've got strong teeth. Anything after about three weeks, you know, their teeth will show up and their teeth will start coming out after about three weeks. And as it grows, the mother will slowly, slowly start introducing to them meat. So they'll stop first, look. So one is still eating, but if they hear any small movement, they have to be careful. Could it be hyena? Could it be a leopard? No. Could it be a lion? No. And once they realize there's nothing happening, they continue eating. And if you look carefully, this, the mother is just there, relaxed, allowing the kids to, the, the cubs to eat, because that's her main job. But you notice, Senzo will take you back to the cubs. They are eating exactly. You see the, you see the cubs there. They are eating very fast. And that's very typical of cheetahs. Even if they're fully grown, they always eat very quickly, 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 quickly. Because the faster they eat, the better it should. Do you see the mother looking? See the baby there? Oh, sorry, yeah, that's one of the young ones, sorry. So should they, hear, should they hear anything coming, like a leopard or a hyena? That's it. They're gone. They'll not eat it anymore. You see how she's looking? They don't take any chances. And she's moving her ears to locate any sound, smells, she turns, looks. As the mother keeps eating, but they never want to take any chances. We have seen many times when 
big predators like lions and leopards and hyenas know that cheetahs have made a kill, they come. Even if they'll not have started to eat, once they arrive, they'll just have to go. They have no choice, which is quite unfortunate. But again, that's how things play out here in the bush. So the first cub must have been quite full, the one they're just enjoying. She must have eaten almost maybe 500 pounds of meat. And now she is slowly snoozing and having a snooze. Just like the cats at home. You see the cats at home, they are, when they are full, they tend to close their eyes and have a snooze. Same case to the cats here. So she keeps, you know, flicking her ears if there's a fly. You see what she does? So a small move, a small sound from somewhere, they'll always look and know what was it. And then maybe she'll tell the mother. You see behind her neck, she has so much fur. So as they grow older, that fur disappears. Just like small babies when they're born sometimes, they have a lot of hair on their bodies. And as we mature, as we grow, that disappears. Now she's looking at the tree with the monkeys. This is exciting and to all of you kids, we are very, very happy. You give us a lot of joy for having joined us and we're saying to all of you, hopefully we'll be seeing you again soon and it's goodbye from all of us and we are now going to Steve who is on the walk. Bye bye. Well, so exciting indeed that David has been with those cheetah and uh, we've come all the way to the west and the tracks have come from this side and you'd expect them to have been in this area, but there's not a single animal to be seen. Normally you find impala, a wildebeest, towards zebra, well, not that many zebra at the moment, but there's always something around. But surely when those three cheetahs moved through, <laughs> animals just disappeared, meaning they had to go all the way through to Gallagher. How marvelous is that? What an amazing area that is turning out to be. Tingana was there the morning before, Hukumuri the night before, Ukumuri last night, cheetah there now. I can't keep track of all of this. I'm doing a catch report this week and I've got to remember all these things. Fantastic. Cheetah on the property. Very, very exciting times ahead. We hope that that mother and her, her two youngsters are able to maintain because, I mean, what she has lost two before, I think, believe one to lions and one to a snake bite. Cheetah, they are very, very susceptible to the competition of other predators in and around. But there are lots of impala around. There are spaces here. We don't see the Unkuhumas or the Styx prides that often in and around. The hyena, hyena are a problem, though, and the number of leopards we have. But an area like this where it's really nice and open, you'd expect to find them probably trying to hang around. But they probably got too hungry and then decided, well, let's keep moving towards where the water is. And that would be the spot to find our animals. And quite rightly, as Brent found the tracks of those cheats, I mean, moving at like one in the afternoon, we do find leopards doing that. It is a relatively cool afternoon, but that is def definitely sort of the time of day cheetah move. So very nice to have found those tracks coming in. Who knows exactly where from, but definitely from the west. But very exciting times ahead. Let's hope we can keep that little family with us. So, Ralph Kirsten is also on drive this afternoon, as you well know. I'm not sure what he's up to, but let's go get an update. Now, everyone, I've just stopped because there was all sorts going on here. There were lots of squirrels and little mongoose. And can you believe it? I can actually see. I don't know, Fergie, if you can see that. Just Perfectly behind. <laughs> perfectly behind. Let me just try to go backwards a little bit. The squirrels normally do bump off. There were squirrels and mongoose and birds and all sorts here. And they just ran off, but if I start up now, they're going to run. Let's just see. Go backwards a little bit. The squirrel is really doing like a little display, display here. I think it's trying to attract the other one. Let's just pop ourselves a little bit. It's putting on a, a rather nice show. Let's just see if we can get them coming out. There we go. I would oh this one's going crazy. Watch him. Look at him. Just like I really think it's doing a bit of displaying because oh she's like I need a super slow mo with that one. Yes. 
Who is there now? Yeah, there we go. I think he's showing off to the girls. What are you up to? He's chewing and doing all sorts of strange things. So we always just stop and look at the smaller things as well. Yeah, I don't know what he's foraging. What he's foraging for there. I think he's almost just showing his. Is he eating that bark? Might just be showing his chisel like um, teeth off to the female. But he is actually feeding on it. It's in the quarry thick at this. So I'm not quite sure what he would be finding nutritious on that old branch. Maybe he's just hoarding it into his uh, sort of cheek pouches. Maybe going to go and use it for nesting material. They often, oh, Pisces, yes, and he, the reason he ran off was because a little mongoose came in. There we go, Pisces, I agree, very cute, eh? So are the little mongoose. And this is the reason why I stopped here, because there was all sorts going on. And now the squirrel back up the branch. There he is. Oh, it's either him or her. One of the two. And there's all sorts happening here. <laughs> Deadhead Tom, you saying no to squirrel decaf? Yeah, well, I, I think it would be a good idea because if he has um, non-decaffeinated uh, coffee, I think it might put him over the edge. They're quite... Uh, Oh, look at that. There he's jumping again. Oops. Hey, yes, but difficult for Ferg to follow there. I think, uh, imagine a squirrel after a cup of coffee. That would be absolutely hectic. They're hectic as it is. But it seems like it's all calmed down a little bit. All right. I think, uh, let's start up and head on. Things are slowing down a little bit here. I'm hoping to catch up with some elephants, but I think I might have missed their, their little routine walk through um, past Twin Dams. But I'm just going to head down this road, this sort of mumba loop, and um, just see if we can maybe see any signs of leopards. Otherwise, I'm going to go to Twin Dams. Mrs. Lapwing, um, you can have squirrels and mongoose having a little bit of tiffs, but you generally find them sort of mingling in the same area, and they do look out for each other. It's not on purpose, really, but they will give the little uh, alarm signals, and both uh, react to that. So they, they do work together in, in more ways than one, but um, obviously they can also get a bit irritated with each other, but with the squirrels uh, being a little bit less... Oh, and the birds are having a bit of an argy bargy. Little crested Franklins here. So with the mongoose being a, a lot more in uh, numbers, you know, they're more gregarious. Uh, if there was a bit of a tiff, I would put my money on them, because they'll sort the the squirrels out. But I've also seen, you know, the surrikits and the ground squirrels. Uh, they very often, um, they can even be in the same burrow together. I've seen that in the Namib, in the Kalahari Desert as well. And so that's very interesting to watch that. The ground squirrels and the surrikits or the meerkats. But, you know, I, I don't like using the word meerkat. I know it's been made famous by meerkat manor and all of that, but meerkat for me is a generalization for all the mongoose. And um, better to say surrogate, because meerkat, in, in fact, uh, directly translated, is actually the water mongoose, because it's the lake cat. So for me, that's, that's where the meerkat, meerkat, it's not meerkat, it's meerkat. That's where the name comes from, and uh, well, we say in English mere cat, but it's not actually that. It's, a, it's an Afrikaans word, and uh, actually from the water mongoose, which is black and solitary, and so not really the surrogates at all. So I would rather say surrogate, to be precise. But uh, we do see a lot of dwarf mongoose around here. And there is just some water dung that I've just driven 
over, very similar to uh, zebra dung, but it doesn't have those little kidney shapes. It's uh, literally just little balls, but almost identical to zebra dung, also hindgut fermenters, so very similar. All right, so we've been watching a little bit of the smaller things, and I'm just going to keep scratching around this area, going nice and slowly. But while somebody else is stationary, David, let's go back to those beautiful cheetah. Yes, I got bigger things here, and beautiful cheetahs, truly beautiful cheetahs. And it's a mother and her two cubs, and still feeding on their late lunch of. Impala, and you see she was looking up a little bit because on a tree, on a dead mulva tree to our left, we have seen two vultures that are trying to descend on that tree, which means they might have picked, either have sensed or smelled it or seen this kill, and we've got two vultures which are trying to circle around here and trying to descend. And look at the mother they are pulling. My guess is... Sharon, good question. How did we find the cheetahs? And in neighboring to a camp, we had our friends of ours who say they could have had a commotion and they saw something like a cat chasing an impala. And they're not very sure. And they told us to come and check, not very far from where we are. It's very close to a camp called Galago Lodge, or camp, uh, a camp or a lodge called Galago. And when we came here, truly we found it was a cheetah and had two cubs. And I would say is only 10 meters away from the fence of the camp. Can you believe it? Some of the guests, I think, might have seen the run. They didn't maybe see the actual takedown, but what I've gathered, some of the guests were saying they saw something running, and I think their new guests, they could not tell the difference between a cheetah and impala, but they said they saw something chasing each other, then they reported to the manager, and then the manager called us, and they said, why don't you find out? And those guests were right. What they saw was a cheetah chasing down an impala. And it must be a very courageous cheetah to bring down a mini parlor. Rari was the kill caught on camera. Unfortunately, I have not been able to meet either of these guests, and maybe even for them, they were very excited to see that, and they must have missed it. And Larry, remember, cheetahs are very fast. Even for us, sometimes it's always very difficult to get the takedown because they move so fast, talking of about 110 kilometers per hour. That's like flying low. So I do not think anybody caught it on camera. I doubt, but maybe if I would meet any of those guests, I would find out from them if any one of them caught that in camera. But that's highly doubtable because of the speed these cheetahs go. It's very good mother. She has been allowing the cubs to fit to feed the last uh, half an hour and now she's just digging in and one of the cubs just laying on the side enjoying so as usual cheetahs we look eat back fantastic you have been spoiled again with cheetahs and I could not agree with you more and above all back with a kill not just only cheetahs but you have a bonus they are feeding that's pretty special and that's Beck gives me lots of joy knowing that the dynamics here are working out very well. The ecosystem balances very well. The predators are having enough to eat. The prey as much as unfortunately one has been brought down. That's the how things happen here in the bush. They have also enough to eat and that tells us our office is being taken care of nicely. So the cab will rise. We look, we had monkeys here earlier, the vavin monkeys, and they were very vocal. But I think they found out if the cheetahs got the impala kill, they will not bother coming for us. So they all kept quiet at the moment. So one thing I've found with cheetahs, they eat very fast, very quickly, because they know the challenges they face. Of the smaller cats, I would say this is the biggest, but for the larger cats, talking of, say, leopards, lions, or jaguars, let's see, of lions and leopards here. If the lions pick the scent of this impala, or the leopards, I'll tell you, they'll be here in minutes. This morning we saw Hukumuri and we had hyenas who picked the scent of the kill and they came and they gave him a lot of trouble. So cheetahs, you know, ideally because they do not drag 
their meals or their kills up a tree when it's on the ground they have to do the best they can in the shortest possible time to fill up very quickly before the predators can pick it up. Junior animation, your question is, do I think these cheetahs will stick around in Juma? I would say so, because last week we saw her and the cubs, I think, two days straight. And I was the last one to see them when they went to a different property. And under one week, exciting, they're back. I think they are loving the amount of prey we got around here. I would want to believe they'll stick around in Juma, which will be a lot of joy for all of us. Yeah, swing of a tail there shows you total happiness. So one will keep looking and you get, it's quite unusual to see, say, the three of them eating together. So one of them will be on the lookout and then when they think all is good, they may all dig in together. But cheetahs, you'll always get one of them looking out, making sure there's nobody's coming. Earlier we had seen two vultures circling and flying around and definitely they must either have picked the scent in the air and they are like any time now they come. What would happen is if the numbers of the vultures would grow to anything like 20, 30, 40, they might descend on the kill and intimidate the cheetahs to leave. But one, two, three, four, five, I would say so far so good. The characteristic black tear marks on cheetahs, unlike all the other cuts, and more so which separates them in the difference of physical characteristics with the leopards. My guess is these cubs here are anything between seven and eight months, seven and eight months. That I might have gathered from uh, one of my co-guides who might have, who got some good history of these cheetahs here. They will be about seven and eight months. And she initially had four and she has lost two one two lions as usual because of predator competition and unfortunately she lost the other one to a snake bite i got a feeling these two here at eight months or seven chances are they'll make it Leah, I agree with you. These cheetahs are very hungry. If they're very hungry, if you look, you know, on the belly, you can tell it's a little caved in. They yeah, are very good sense of there. And this is before they started to eat. So do you imagine how it was before eating? So Leah, I agree with you. They are very hungry, and the speed they are eating at as much as cheetahs will eat very fast. It tells you they are very hungry. And what they don't want to do is to take any chances with the predators. The mother cheetah, I've seen her on a few occasions looking on top of the marua tree and definitely she spotted the vultures there. And you know the whole idea here is grab or eat as much as they can before maybe in a slight sense start radiating away from them to the hyenas or to the leopards. My biggest concern I would be hyenas. Hyenas got very sharp sense of scent and they could get here faster than anybody else leopards could only or lions could only get this kill either by chance if they happen to be around here as much as also they might smell it right let's go to the gentleman who is looking at the ground and on the walk steve well, we're looking at more than the ground. We're looking at a pile of poo. Now, I know it looks in a very nice little little bundle there. I did collect it. I did collect it with my hand. And that is all of it. That is all of it there. And it's important to pay attention to when you're looking at dung to see if you can get all of it there. If you can sort of see the, tot the total pile. Because this dung you could quite easily confuse with zebra. But in fact, it is not zebra. I'm going to pick up one. And break it open for you. It's got a bit of a black tinge on the outside, but there's also a little bit of orange to it. If we break it open, you can see it's very poorly digested inside. You can see there's grass material in there, and you might even come across uh, roots of grasses and things. Very poorly digested, and this is in fact the dung of a warthog. 
and very important to identify. It is a small warthog that did this. You can tell by the size of the pellets, it's quite small. But even a baby zebra, if it have to defecate and they were this size, it'd probably be twice, maybe even three times the amount of dung there. And zebra, the sides are very, very flat almost like a Zippo lighter, where this has almost got more of a roundish sort of shape to it. It's is, it is quite oblong, but a little bit sort of rounded on the side, not so sort of flat on the side there. So easily identified as warthog. And zebra's got a, a darker, darker sort of color. I'll try and find some for you. And obviously when you find a large warthog, so say it's this big, the pile is also going to be quite small because of the body size of the animal, whereas a zebra with a large piece it's going to be a huge pile because they're just far bigger as we know as we know animals that are bigger like elephants much larger stool so that was another poo story for you out there I know there's a lot of viewers are quite interested in following the poo tales or hashtag poo stories they go on and on and on endlessly Let's see if we can find some more for you this afternoon So we've come, continued on into the west, because uh, our original mission was to obviously follow up on, on potentially the Shadulu female leopard, and we found those cheetah tracks. There's no point following them because we, we knew where they were. So we're still going to have a look around. It is a cool afternoon. It's not, not hot really at all, and so very good chance there could be cats moving in this temperature. So never know. We could be lucky. We just check. Something could come through. Something could be on the hunt. Hello everyone, well I'm just slowly wheeling forward here because we've got some uh, beautiful elephants starting to show themselves. So I thought we'd stop and have a wonderful look and spend some time with them. One of my favourite things to do, spending time with elephants. And apparently there's a very big herd in the area here, so I wonder if they've all come together, these sort of broken up patchy herds that we've been seeing recently, uh, probably all part of a bigger herd. Yesterday we had a wonderful sighting with them next to Chitwa waterhole, and they did display something quite strange. And this one is vocalizing now. And you know what, it's, there's a lot of vocalizing coming from down where this elephant has turned his head towards. And I think that's probably where the rest of the herd is. There was a little bit of trumpeting there as well. You see how he's putting his ears out, I think he's actually listening. Lots of communication going on. Most of which, as you know, we can't hear. It's too low for the human ear. It's incredible the amount of communication that does go on with elephants. And while well, he listened out there for quite a while, now sort of back to his business, maybe just listening out for what was being transmitted from the herd. There are some more waking, making their way up, but uh, we can't see them clearly just yet. I'm sure we're going to see some more elephants coming through here. It's quite strange. You see how he's stopped was listening. They seem to be feeding a little bit on that bush willow. It's a beautiful specimen. Okay, so I think we're going to hang around here. We'll at least try and see where the rest of this herd is. But um, while well, I was so excited about finding those cheetah the other day, and how great is it that they have now returned again? Yes, Raf spotted these cheetahs for the first time last week, and we were so proud of him. And here they are back again, and as the mother moving slowly, going to that patch of sun there, either to get the warmth after eating a lot, and you can see the belly is bulging up a little bit. A bit of panting, and cheetahs do not pant as much as leopards 
punch when they have eaten, and you can tell, of course, one is because of the difference of size. She's licking herself now because of all the blood, and also that will help maybe not to radiate a lot of a smell out there in the air and keep the kill as discreet as possible until the cubs are well fed. And what she's doing now, she's looking on top of a tree, and on top of that tree, there's a vulture slowly coming in. I'm not sure it's a hooded vulture. The vultures, there are two of them there. The two of them look like hooded vulture, and they must have picked the smell of this impala here. And she's looking at them. She's not worried at the moment. I'm sure two will rarely come down, or three or four. Anything would be, say, ten. That would be a big number, and they'd all descend. And the cheetahs will have no choice but to walk away. Her biggest concern to me, I would guess, would be a hyena. Minamu, you'd like to know how does a cheetah's tail help when running? I would say they'll use the tail as a rudder, and when they run, and they decide to take a different direction, I think the tail either pops up or turns in one way, and that helps the cheetahs to have any particular angle. You see that tail there? Any particular angle they want. So I think they use it here, like if you see a helicopter, they have that little propeller at the back there, and if that propeller is not working very well, the helicopter loses it is bearing the landing or the takeoff of the flying you'll see is a bit wobbly or not very straight up and down turning different directions so i doubt a cheetah without a tail it would keep say, a straight line and should it need to stop and have an you know an accurate change of angle the, the tail will like always help it as a rudder to take those sharp changes in directions so I'd compare a cheetah's tail to a rotor of a helicopter. A helicopter without a rotor, you'll see them always losing directions and the pilots will always try and land them. So the tail will always help the cheetah as it runs. Should it want to turn, if the prey turns, you'll see the tail going in one direction and I'm sure it hinges its bearing of angle on that particular point at the very base of the tail from the hind quarters. Raf got very big mammals with him. Well, I thought it was a male, but now on closer inspection, I think this is a female. So a young female that's just a little bit apart from the herd. And, well, she's feeding quite nicely on this uh, red bush willow, Combretum apiculatum. That's the name, the four winged seed pods. And there is a lot of communication going on. You can't hear it now while she's feeding, but there's a lot of elephants down in the drainage line. But I'm just enjoying this one for a little while. Once she moves off, we'll go and have a look at the rest of this big herd that is all joined up together. Look at her getting stuck into this red bush willow. It's one of the hardest woods that you could ever possibly find. The only denser wood than a red bush willow is the zebra wood, Dalbergia melanoxylon. Um, but they also don't really grow into big trees. The red bush willow is probably the most prized of all firewood. Uh, Gigi, you say that it looks like short trunk the elephant. I didn't notice the tip of its trunk. I'm going to now pay attention there. I wonder if you're right. Oh, Ferg's saying it does look a bit short. I'm just trying to see now. Gigi, that's that's a good observation. I wasn't even I didn't even notice that. Well done. It does. It does hang in a very small herd, which is a small... Uh -huh. Yes, it definitely does. That, that tip of the trunk is missing. That is very interesting. I wonder how she lost the end there, if that was due to a snare, maybe. It can quite easily happen. A little bit of a snare, get on the tip there. But at least it looks like she's doing pretty well without it. 
little bit of a youngster there coming up with another female as well. So Kirsten's saying, like Ferg said, um, they seem to move in a small little herd. There's about five of them. But there is a lot of elephants further down here. So they might just be hanging off to the side. But obviously still moving along with the greater part of this herd. That's a pretty female now coming towards us as well. Hasn't got very big tusks, but she is a fully... Uh, she's not a, a massive female, but uh, so peaceful, aren't they? Wonderful to sit with them. I always enjoy it. There is something very special about elephants that uh, it's almost it can't be explained. It has to be experienced. Especially when they're just in a very tranquil mode, moving through, feeding. And there's a youngster. Now, here comes Short Trunk next to us, rubbing herself up against the branches as she makes her way. Yeah, that could be quite a disability, you know, having the trunk cut off because they, they use it for so many different things. But she seems to be doing very well. Doesn't seem to have affected her much at all. I wonder if what age it happened. If it happened when she was very young, well, you know, any kind of disability is um, best to be, you know, you don't wish a disability on a youngster, but um, it's uh, the, the easiest or the, the most um, uh, adaptation from an individual is when, if it happens when you're young, uh, you know, for an older individual it does take a lot more effort and, and practice because, you know, like they say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Now, our beard, I agree with you 100%. It's a little bit like missing a piece of your lip or some, you know, the, the fingers on your dominant hand. You know, my father, he's an engineer and um, he's right handed and uh, he had an accident with a, with a saw, a circular saw, and he, he cut off his two um, dominant fingers. So his middle finger and the index finger um, cut off at the knuckle. Um, so, yeah, it took him probably the good parts of about three years just to learn how to write again. And uh, quite amazing, how to tie his shoelaces was uh, quite an effort. And so it's um, definitely, I understand from that perspective, not uh, that I could say personally, but um, I know somebody very close to me that has lost, uh, you know, their fingers. And I would, I would liken it to that. But you have to learn how to, you know, do the most basic of things. Whereas if it happens when you're a youngster, like this, maybe this little baby elephant that's coming towards us now, it would obviously adapt much quicker. And if you were born with it like that, well, you wouldn't know any different. So the adaptation would be immediate because uh, that's, what, that's what you've got to use. So you just make do. Very interesting, eh? The way we can adapt. Now, uh, sorry, what was the name again there, um, Kirsten? Tula Ann. Um, well, the answer to that question is, um, you know, the way that they they feed, there's not really that much of a chance that they can choke. Um, I'm sure that there's sometimes a little bit of, of a food that gets stuck, but I've never seen an elephant choking, um, and it's quite interesting that they use their trunk, uh, they breathe with their trunk, it's like us with our nose. See, their trunk is modified, uh, and it's modified from their nose. So if, they, if something gets stuck in their mouth, they could always breathe with their trunk. But I've never seen an elephant choking. I don't think it's, uh, 
it's really easy for them to choke. They do have very big mouths. And look at this little one. He's feeding on all sorts. And it's amazing that elephants can even eat thorns. But he's a little cutie, isn't he? Using that trunk to feel around, to sniff the air, to taste all the little bits and bobs. See how he uses his foot as well? He's obviously seen something there that he wants to look. He grabs it and pushes it with his foot. And then he breaks it off. There he goes again. Break that little bit of grass off. He seems to like that. Look at those beautiful eyelashes as well. Very important to stop any little things that maybe want to go inside their eyes and dust and, and anything that might go into their eye because they can't go to the eye doctor and get their eyes fixed they've only got one chance out here in the bush and that goes from the cheetah to the impala to the kudu to the elephants they've only got one chance so they need to make it count and their bodies need to be adapted to help them survive. Now, speaking of the cheetah, uh, let's go back to them and see how their meal is going. And we have the cheetahs now, still feeding, and the mother has now, one of the cubs, sorry, has stepped on the side and has left two, the mother and one of the cubs feeding. Look at that one there. She's, I think, now happily fed and not worry if the vultures would come down, but the mother has to keep eating. So up the tree now, what we have been seeing are vultures slowly coming in. We have seen two, one white-backed vulture, but now the mother is very busy feeding with one of the cubs. I once saw two cheetahs that were fully grown and they had a kill, and hyenas, you know, picked that kill before they even had started because when cheetahs go for their kills and they do a very big chase, the body temperatures shoot very high and sometimes it's rather difficult for them just to finish the kill, finish the takedown and start eating. They always pause for a few minutes before eating. And what happened, there was a pack of about four or five hyenas that came shortly after. And these two cheetahs, I can tell you, they held their ground and made sure those hyenas went away and they ate their kill. That was quite unusual, but that rarely happens. Hyenas are known to be very courageous, but that was a, one very special case where I saw, like, you know, cheetahs get out of way, we cannot have done such a big job, and then you come and have our food. So more vultures are coming in, and you might hear a bit of some sound of a vehicle coming close to where we are. The other guests in the camp. Minamu, you're asking, do cheetah uh, cheetah females hold territory not really cheetahs both males and females i would say they have what they call home ranges and the home ranges are huge leopards both females and males will have uh, home ranges i mean territories but cheetahs do not so i would say cheetahs are not territorial and what they do is they have huge massive home ranges they do not you know i would say they're not territorial and they not keep any any territory for themselves not even the males i would guess you know give or take you might see a cheetah depending on the amount of food or the habitat they might have see a home range of about 30 acres sometimes in big areas like in the Masimara where they have you know big portions and uh, a lot to eat they might go up to 800 acres that's like the home range of the cheetahs but Minamu cheetah females are not territorial at all we saw them here last week, and if you don't know, I was the last one with them, as I said before, and they went to different property. We do not know how far they went, and then they are back with us today. So anything 30 to about 800 acres of, you know, size of land, that's like the home range for the cheetahs. So leopards, lions, territorial, and they'll protect their territories and the home, you know, the area they live in but cheetahs are here today tomorrow they could be like another 40 50 kilometers from here i gathered these cubs were born a long way from where we are in the background you can still hear the velvet monkeys 
because every time these cheaters put their faces on them, they worry as much as they were quiet before. So that one is keeping an eye, not on the monkeys, but I would say ideally hyenas, vultures, or leopards, or lions that would want to come and get the kill. We have always seen some of the mothers once fully grown, I mean the cubs are still young, after they finish eating, you see the female or the mother licking the mouth of the cubs, just making sure they conceal any kill. The mother just looks there. I'm not sure what she saw, she just looked very attentively, something got her attention. You can see the eyes there. Hopefully not a hyena or a leopard or a lion, hopefully not, but you can tell, look at her. So until she is certain, there's nothing to worry, is when she'll continue eating. You can see the panting right below her mouth, on the neck. So when she's sure all is good, She'll go down to the kill. You can see it was red on the mouth. And again, remember to keep asking questions as usual. Hashtag Safari Live. And make this drive interactive. And keep engaging us. Because you give us a lot of joy with your comments. With your thoughts. And what you think is happening here. As we share with you this beauty of the wilderness of South Africa. Uh, Samu, I think your question was, do cheetahs have a fear of height, right, Casting? Very good. Uh, Samu, I do not think so. We have seen cheetahs, because they're not, you know, very tall cats, when they want to make a kill or they want to know where they're going to get a prey or they're going to get an animal or some food, we have seen them climbing some tamarind mounds or we have seen them climbing some logs and when they climb some logs they get some height and that height will make them look around and see what is surrounding them and they can see where an impala like the one they're eating where it is or a different type of animal so cheetahs i would say they're not scared of height we have seen them sometimes playing and going up a tree not really like leopards maybe up to five six meters that height and then coming down but they're not very good in climbing trees and you can tell they're quite hungry and what I've noticed they have tried to do they have been avoiding to eat the stomach contents what they've been eating is just I would not say the fillet or you know or the steak but just eating the outer part and avoiding the stomach content and uh, guess what that will do it will keep the skill as discreet as possible until they get full the moment they open the stomach content you know that smell will just go out very quickly and will be picked by their enemies rough steel goods more ellis That's everyone managed to find two young bulls that uh, are really having a, a nice little wrestling match here because we're right in the thick of this herd now and it's wonderful to watch these guys you see them put their trunks they often wrap them around each other and a little bit of pushing backwards and forwards you know real playfulness I'm oh, sorry, the gremlins are getting us a little bit here, but there's not much chance for me to move because I've got elephants all around me. And I don't want to disturb them. So Sorry if there's a bit of pixelation or breakup. But it is fascinating to watch them all playing, communicating. And they're also getting a little bit of soil here. There we go. I think that other one's going to come back. He's just going to pretend like he's going away. Oh, no, he's taking out his frustration on the bush. And this one's saying, all right, here we go. Oh, a little bit of a passing wind there in amongst it. <laughs> the very gassy animals, are they? Putting on the boosters to go up the hill. The boosters going up the hill, says Ferg. 
You can hear the communication. All sorts of going on. In a minute, I'm going to try and catch up a little bit with that herd there and uh, also get us just slightly better signal, I think, that we won't have any breakup. They seem to have given us a gap, so I might just move a little bit. And they seem to be quite comfortable with our presence, so and wow, it's going to be making for a beautiful sunset as well. So I'm just going to slowly make our way around there. And uh, while I'm doing that, well, it would be rude not to go back to those three wonderful Well, Ruff, get a better position for those Ellis and see how they'll continue sparring or playing about. And the cheetahs now have all together decided to dig in and go and eat. We had them eating in uh, like intervals, you could see two eating together and one, you know, watching around to make sure nothing happens. Or as one could be eating, two watching, but now it's like all of them have said, you know what, it's time to keep eating. Because the danger of the enemies or other predators coming in, it's growing with time. We initially had two vultures and now I'm counting about six. So we do not know what that might translate into and she is curiously looking in that direction to see if anything and it's a nice cat was allowing the mother now to eat because she basically also needs to eat a lot the last time we had these cheetahs they brought down i believe a baby kudu and a kudu a baby kudu is a big prey by any standard for a cheetah to bring down and today to bring an impala male is fantastic Charlie, how are you? And you're asking what's the biggest prey a cheetah can bring down. And that's a very interesting question. I would say this, or what they're eating at the moment, is one of the biggest prey for a cheetah to bring down. I mean, some of these impalas are about 60 kilos or about 100 plus pounds. That's something very big for the cheetahs because it's almost twice the weight over cheetah. So I would say this is one of the biggest prey they would bring down. Last week they brought down a baby kudu and that was also massive. But we have seen when males come together, fully grown males, we have seen them bringing down even baby zebras or bringing down even baby wildebeest, you know. But I would say this is one good example for you of a cheetah bringing down a very large prey. And it did not go for the female, of course, depending on the circumstances or where it made its own judgment and thought. This is the one to bring down. They'll always, you know, go for females, but I would say this is one very good mother. To bring down a baby kudu, to bring down an impala and not a female is a male, where they would risk getting hurt by the horns, I think she is a fantastic mother. You might hear a car in the background making some sound. But those are friends of ours who have come and joined us on the sighting. How colorful to see the horns hanging out there and the red on the flesh and the mother cheetah looking. They will not, they'll never take any chances. And as much as they can, they'll keep eating and chances are, unlike leopards or lions, will always have a little break, a kind of a commercial break, eat, go have a drink, come back, or go drink, you know, in intervals, cheetahs will make sure once they eat, they're full, chances are they may not come back to the same kill. And unlike, you know, the leopards and lions, cheetahs, you have seen them, they will not have the same kill for more than a day. They'll do the hunt, eat as much as they can, and the only chances are once they move, they move on and they're done with it. Occasionally we've seen them coming back to the kill after about an hour or two or three, but more often than not, I would say nine out of ten times, once they're full, they're done. They'll always know other predators will most likely come in and they do not want to take a risk facing off with leopards or hyenas or even sometimes with the vultures. Especially if they have very young cubs. 
All right, let's go to Steve. As you find out, we'll find, tell you later what his mother is looking at. Let's go to Steve now. Thanks, David. What a marvelous afternoon you're having. We saw vultures in all different directions coming from, from overhead. We almost thought maybe that they were taking off from something in the ground, but now we realize they're headed in the direction of you and your cheetah. So we stopped here for a marula tree that um, is right up on top. We're right up on top of the sort of katina, sort of the slope, and this marula has still got a couple of leaves, uh, which is a good indication that it's got access to the water because most of the other marulas that you see around here do not. They've lost their leaves already. Those two at the back there already lost their leaves. So I just wanted to grab a couple because I am doing some medicinal projects with, with marulas in the next few days. So I just want you to get a quick sample. So you, you can chew these leaves. And if you can swallow the fluid that you generate from it, it's very good for heartburn. But I have yet to manage swallowing one, the liquid, the stringent they call it. So I'm going to try a different mechanism. I'm going to try to pulverize it, make it into sort of a bit of a mouthwash that you can swallow and see if that works. Because honestly, and I'll show you now, if you chew on it, it's not great at all. But it gives off this very sort of, I don't know if you can see, there's like a whitish sort of fluid coming out of it. Kind of. I'm going to try and get that astringent and make it into a little brew and see. Dave seems to kind of, uh, struggle with some heartburn, so get him to be the guinea pig once again. At least this time I'll tell him it's something he's going to swallow. It's not going to be an enema. He was quite reluctant to attempt my enema last week. Oh, that was this week, in fact. So, beautiful afternoon it has been. Still quite cloudy, so we feel like we're probably going to lose light a little bit earlier than normal. So we're slowly starting to make our way back. Haven't had any tracks or any luck of the Shadulu female up on this side, but uh, that is the way the cookie crumbles. It has been a very quiet afternoon, in fact. We haven't seen many animals this side. We're really wondering what's happened, where they are. Maybe the presence of the cheetah or hukumuri moving out this morning has caused them all to vanish. I haven't even seen an impala, have we, Craig? No, no impala. Hello, Monique. Well, we don't have a magic quarry up here on the slope. They're quite characteristic down in the bottom of the katina, the slope. And you want to know why they call it a magic quarry? Well, what, what makes it so magic? Now, there's belief that um, traditional healers used to smoke the plant before giving, sort of like uh, giving, telling your fortune, so to speak, predicting the future. They used to smoke the roots. I think it was the roots or it was the bark. Smoke it into sort of a pipe and it'll give them a bit of a, because the, the name, is actually called Euclea divinorum, is the species name divinorum, to divine. And there's two purposes. Divine is to either give a divination of the future, or also some people think that you can hold the branches and it helps you to find water. Either one could be plausible, but what I do know is that magic quarries where they grow is an indication of water. If you can dig, there you will get to water. So good root system, always evergreen, growing in areas where there's moisture. But I think the magic comes from the fact that because you smoke it, you can give a, a fortune. I think that's what it's all about. But I could be wrong. That's the stories I've been told. But maybe I'll do a little bit more reading. No doubt the magic quarry is going to feature in one of my medicinal Monday mornings. But enough of my ramblings. David Dietz's got some really cool content this afternoon. Yes, uh, make sure, you know, Steve gets a lot of medicine. Hopefully, she's going to bring some to the camp tonight after dinner and we can enjoy his medicine. And the mother there decided to have a break and is back on her sunny patch, which I guess is giving her a bit of warmth. The substrate there is giving her a bit of warmth and just allowing the cubs to keep eating. But one of them is not taking any chances. She keeps looking. She initially had a very weird look or a very concerned look of something that could be happening but we just found out it was maybe a false alarm. She might have seen a grass just move or maybe an antelope just walking away and she thought, wow, it's time of food to be taken but so far it is so good. I must say I'll have a lot of respect 
for this female from the size of prey she has brought down I, I you know I would say hands up and well done for this female here that's a pretty good job because the last we had of her the prey she had was you know a young or you know a young a young kudu and it was by any standard a big prey for a cheetah so an impala which could be almost 150 pounds it is something very cool you know females being 18 80 pounds that's a lot bigger prey uh, than the cheetah herself and she must be a very good but the, how she lost the other two uh, is a bit sad but not much could have done on a snake bite you know not much could have done but of course again the other one she lost to the lions she couldn't of course maybe fight the lions and maybe her quick judgment was lose one and maybe protect the other two I don't know whether at that time she had lost the other one to the snake but I think you know good mothers would like sacrifice one for the for the rest speed is always very very virtual or very important to the cheetahs you notice as she pants there if it was a leopard having eaten the same you could see the belly going up and down and the panting is massive massive and I was thinking maybe is because I'm not sure the digestive system is different as much as they are designed to be energy efficient but this is just like a normal breathing a little bit of panting but leopard goes you know up and down up and down so she looks she keeps looking at that direction I've tried to look myself I did not see anything but it's like something that doesn't make her very happy well a little bit of a concern but I don't see what she's looking at sir so would I say the cheetahs are more relaxed in the matter I would say yes for only one reason it's a totally different habitat with the savanna and the grassland in the position like this ones are they are comfor comfortably able to see a predator coming from a long way and they'll calculate we have to eat quickly we have to go but the kind of thicket we have around here in Juma it makes it rather difficult for them and a hyena or a leopard can just sneak on them and steal their kill so I would say they're more relaxed there than here just because of the habitat they find themselves to be in and that's why I think this mother is very worried will eat and stand and look as much as also in the Mara cheetahs will never eat for more than five ten minutes without looking at their surroundings Again, I would say well done to this mother. Angie, the ones that are very clear now, we got three and then another four. We can't see them very well. So those two to the left are the hooded vulture. Angie, you'd like to know how many vultures we have now. So those you see two to the left of your screen, those to the hooded vulture and far right, we have the white back the vulture but there are four on a different tree that's behind us so total we have seven they'll have to be very patient until this leaves they'll not get any chances trying to come down and as I said earlier I've seen two cheetahs you know fighting off five hyenas which was quite unusual so if these vultures do not want to take in chances I mean the cheetahs or the mother could easily just give them a few slaps we have seen that with the lions so they better wait there until she leaves or until they're done this is just marvelous Please keep sending your thoughts and maybe keep describing the sighting to to us as you show hashtag Safari Live. And you can see the fence you just saw there earlier from Senzo. We are very close to the Galago, Galago camp, where the killing, you know, took part like another an hour or so and a half ago. So here's you saying would the three of them you know have eaten all this kid or we leave some my guess is I doubt they'll finish all of it 
And if they do, they will do more of the fillet steak, more the venison, and the internal contents, they're going to leave it here. So the mother looks pretty well fed now, but I think the young ones at the age of seven, eight months, they'll keep eating. And after some time, once they go for a drink, I can tell you, they will not come back for it. So I don't see them going more than 50% of that kilo. That's what I'm thinking, not more than 50%. That, but that's a guess. Because you see one, one, one of the youngsters there is like, well, I'm done. It's just dozing off. That's a sign of satisfaction. The mother just letting them now keep eating. And as we saw in the belly of the mother, she looks pretty good. So one you see there to the right, I've seen her on occasions. So it's just the vultures that just uh, scooped them there. So just spoke them. They're trying to get close, the two hooded vultures. And I'm not sure they're trying to intimidate the cheetahs to, the cheetahs to leave. That would happen a lot. But the one particular species of vulture that would think would just come and scare them off would be the lappet or the Nubian vulture. Those ones are huge and two of them are just enough to land here and the cheetahs will just walk away. I mean, I, I'm happy. The mother looks quite content to me. Happy, done. I uh, would say a job well done to bring down the impala for herself and for her youngsters. So she's just now spying and looking and I'm not sure she's looking at me, maybe not. Maybe she's looking at Senzo and just making sure the predators, other predators don't come. And she looks up once in a while. There's one particular hooded vulture is trying to fly around on top of them. An indication, are, we, are, you, are you done? Do you, do you need to move? You're coming down. And then it goes back to the same tree and patches and the same area. I'd want to see a scenario like what we had in the morning with hyenas and the leopard the rough. But I think uh, the hyenas got enough of that kill or what they ate from Hukumuri. Hukumuri is a male leopard around this area. So this one particular youngster will need to keep eating. Swings the tail a little bit for a sign of happiness, satisfaction. And the mother just watching them and like cubs you need to eat before we get the predators coming. Let's find out what direction Raf is taking now. Well, everyone, I've had to leave that nice big herd of elephants because uh, the gremlins were just getting the better of us there. But, um, oh, hello, Mr. Nyala. Very elegantly jumping across the road there. It was almost like a, a monkey jumping through the river. He didn't want to get his feet wet. And there's quite a few of them here. But um, I was just saying that... Uh, I'm, uh, I'm moving in the direction of Biffles Hook Dam now because I've got some news that uh, Tandi and Klalamba were over across on Torchwood, but um, just across our eastern boundary, and uh, the guys lost her in a block uh, that um, ended up, it seemed like she was walking towards Biffles Hook Dam. So I'm going to go there after this and see if she doesn't come through there for a drink. If we could catch up with her, it would be wonderful. I haven't seen her in a few days. Well, no, we had her on Chitwa with that kill. That was just a couple of days ago. But uh, we're just watching a couple of these Nyala here feeding through the thickets. But it would be wonderful to catch up with Tandi again. I see some tracks of her along the road here. So she has been mobile in this area. And all we need to do is now just go up and catch up with her. Hopefully she comes across Cheetah Cut Line. And the, um, the reason we're not going into Torchwood, as the rules have been specified, uh, there are some landowners there at present. So in case you were wondering why I'm not popping across the border, um, we're just uh, keeping in line with the rules of the traverse so uh, but it's not long and um, in a couple of days time we will be able to go across onto Torchwood when they aren't there so each specific traverse has its own specific rules and uh, negotiations between the different landowners of which I have no idea what has gone on uh, all I know is from my side we just get um, told when we are allowed to go over or not 
And so that's all that concerns me. And for now, not. But as I said, a couple of days' time, we will. Joy, I agree with you. Thanks for your comment. It would be very nice to see Tandy and Cub. Uh, the, from the news that I got, um, the guys said that it seemed like she was trying to leave the Cub behind and head towards Biffles Hook Dam. So she's just over the boundary, um, right on Cheetah Cut Line. So I'm going to head up there right now and see, in fact, if that is true. Um, but she might be then heading on for a, for a bit of a hunt. Maybe she She's, uh, she's walked that um, bush buck that they had off and maybe she's looking now for a little bit more food for the two of them. But while it all remains to be seen, we'll have to catch up with her first if we can and then we'll uh, be able to go from there. But uh, always nice to pop in at Buffelsook Dam. It's, some, it's a bit of a strange one because it can very often be very quiet at Biffles Hook, but uh, there's been some wonderful sightings there as well of leopard and elephant and, and lions as well coming through to drink. So it's always worth a, nice, a quick pop in. And well, especially if you get news like I've just got that there's potential that Tandy could be making her way there, then uh, that makes it even more worthwhile. So, let's head on that way. We're not too far from there right now. Biffles Hook being, uh, for anybody that doesn't know, any new viewers, Biffles Hook being right on our northeastern boundary, right in the corner. Um, so, that's exactly where I'm going. And what I'm heading up to now is uh, one of the roads that's going to lead us towards Biffles Hook. So, I'm going to, I think, put my foot down a little bit and catch up a bit of speed. And while I'm doing that, let's head you on over to the bushwalk team. It's getting a bit late. I'm sure they would be thinking about heading back towards camp. Hmm, we're slowly heading back. And we found what looks like a, a type of horsefly type of, type of thing. It's not moving very quickly because it's, it's relatively cool. All arthropods do slow down when the temperature slows down or cools down. Anybody know what species it is? I have no idea. He seems to have a little bit of a sort of a proboscis there for penetrating and piercing the skin. And very likely by the the shape of it, be one of those that actually feeds on blood. One of the reasons why lots and lots of our animals like to mud wallow to prevent these things from landing on them and sucking their blood. Nothing more annoying and also more painful than a horsefly biting you. It's very hard to get them if you don't have hands to swat them away. That's why you can see lots of our animals have that ability to sort of twitch their body or their, their skin in all different places. That's an evolutionary adaptation to rid themselves of these sort of biting flies. And mud works very, very well. A very nice story of a of an old sort of ivory hunter who was then deemed a poacher. Sort of spent a lot of his time in the northern Kruger, a place called Pafuri. Name was Bakenya, and he ended up getting into a really whole lot of trouble in Mozambique. He got beaten and robbed and lost all of his stuff, and he had no clothes, and he had to hike like maybe a hundred miles or something to get back to sort of wilderness civilization. And he was getting bitten and eaten by flies and things all along the way, and also burnt by the sun. And so he figured out that covering himself in mud alleviated the sunburn and the biting flies. And all he had was his wits. I don't even think he had shoes. But he made it home, worse for wear. So remember that. If you don't have... So another reason why we like to wear long clothes. When I was up in, in Malawi, especially in the woodland areas of the Mapani felt, there's the tsetse flies up there. They land on you and they can give you a serious, serious bite. It can also lead to all sorts of sicknesses, like sleeping sickness, nyaga, 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 I think it's called. And also it's, it's one of the reasons why, not this specific species, it's one of the reasons why... Um, it's called the fly belt. It's one of the reasons why the Kruger National Park and the northern parts, northeastern parts of the country were never sort of colonized very well. Uh, no cattle, ox wagons or horses could get in. 
because the tsetse flies distributed the disease, which led to people having to walk in and carry things on their own. And we know how, how, how happy people are carrying all their belongings on their back. So it's for that reason that the northern part of the Kruger is still a wilderness area. Or the northern part, northeastern part of South Africa, a lot of Zimbabwe, lots of Botswana, because of tsetse flies. While it looks like a type of horse fly, I don't know what species though. I really don't know it. I just know that it looks like it's going to bite someone, and it's definitely a type of horse fly. It could be, there's a, a variety of species. I'm, and I'll tell you truthfully, no expert when it comes to these sort of things, but learning all the time. And I know there's some entomologists out there that could lend a, a hand in identifying. But I still find that marvelous that we can have conservation areas around the world and they are only there because of a fly. If we were able, if there was no fly back in the day, we're talking 150, 200 years ago, if there was no flies or tsetse flies there with the disease, all these areas would probably be under agriculture, um, they would probably be civilized, but they are conserved and wild. They've got parasites of their own that would be very, very small to see. So I couldn't tell you for 100%, but it's possible that there is something that bites the biting fly, something much, much smaller than itself that could be a parasite to it living inside. There may be, I mean, nematode worms are everywhere in the world. Um, I'd probably ingest that as well from the blood, maybe. But I couldn't tell you for sure, but there's probably a possibility that there's something out there that likes to feast on the blood of these things too. But I do not know for sure. Oh, marvellous. We're going to leave the fly to his very stationary position, and we're going to fly off ourselves as it is getting late. Well, that's a good question. The tsetse fly um, is rather dangerous, but it would have to be the Anopheles mosquito, purely because of its transmission of the malaria virus. Um, so that would probably be the most dangerous with regards to disease, but then the parabuthid or thick-tailed transvaal thick-tailed scorpion has got a tail maybe not as thick as my thumb, maybe about as thick as my little finger, and that can inject an enormous amount of venom into somebody. And if you are a youngster or maybe an old person or maybe you've got heart conditions, it can potentially kill you. So I would say that... The most dangerous. I'm trying to think there's something else. If you ate a blister beetle, you'd blister inside and that can kill you. So that's poisonous. So I think poison is also regarded as being quite dangerous. The aposomatic colors that they give off is saying, don't play with me, I'm dangerous. So that's warning enough. I can't think of anything else right now. I suppose there's a number of spiders could also fall underneath the category of insects. And we get the sack spider, violin spiders, black widow. Lots of things out here, but don't let that stress you out. Don't not come to Africa now because I've listed all sorts of dangerous things. Come here and see it for yourself. We're going to fly off and let's go to Ralph. And I'm not sure as he's seeing, but they're not flying. I do not know what is happening here. These two vultures seem to be in love. Can you listen to that? Oh no. I think it's a long time since I think I saw two vultures. I did you know. <laughs> what a sighting. It's a male and a female and they're definitely in love. I think they got very impatient of the cheetahs leaving and they thought they keep themselves busy. Isn't that clever? Well, I haven't seen that in a long time. Oops. Senzo? Mm -hmm. Have you seen that before? Not yet. Senzo saying he's seeing that for the first time and he's equally excited. Well, the number of vultures is growing now. We have about 12 total. We've got about 12 and they're spread out on all these marua trees around here. And a few more in the jackberry tree in the background there. But I think Toto have counted about 12. But the cheetahs have not stopped eating. They're still eating. And these vultures, I'm trying to imagine. Let's all of us go to the minds of the vultures. And 
you viewers, tell me what do you think the watchers are thinking, or what should you do if you are the watchers? Hashtag Safari Live. Just send us some tweets and tell us what do you think the watchers will be doing? Or do you think they'll just combine forces, descend, and get the cheaters out? Or do they wait until the cheaters leave? Let me know what you think. That was quite exciting to see two of them, you know, out there in love, and uh, I think they're trying to kill the boredom because these cheetahs are not letting go. What you see there, those are the white-backed vultures, which have definitely outnumbered the hooded vultures, which were only two. That number has not changed. And the white-backed vultures always go in big flocks, big numbers. And they'll be here as long as it takes, even at night, until these cheaters leave the kill for them to descend and also start having their turn. I'm not sure they are, they're going to thank the cheaters or they just come down and start helping themselves. And you can tell it's getting a little bit cold for them. Tom, I mean, I, I might share your comment. You think they might gang up and go down for the cheaters. I might, uh, I'll share your comment. I've seen that before, where the voters get very patient, like those two we just saw. And if the numbers get anything 20 plus, they start going from the branches where they are, where you can see them now, they would go two meters down to the next level of branches, and then another two meters down, and then they end up on the ground. Pause, look, and then slowly, they move forward a meter, they move forward two meters, and they start moving their heads and their wings, and they start opening their wings and looking big. And I can tell you, we have seen that happening, and the cheetahs will always, like, back off and go. Tom, I think that could be a possibility. Please keep telling me what are your thoughts, what are your comments. If you are the vultures up there, what would you do? And you can see very fresh food there. They'll go for carrions, you know, scavenge on old kills, but this is very fresh. And all the time I've been here is for the first time now, I got small little smell of the venison. I've not been smelling it since we got here, but slowly now coming. Bron, you say those chase the cheetahs. True, true, definitely. You'd imagine you're there, Bron, and you're hungry, and you can see the food, and you have big numbers. Easy, just come down. <laughs> well, uh, casting the final control tells me 70% of you think they would give up and go away. And we saw, I mean, two of them after getting bored and not giving up, you know, they were in love there. But yes, I agree, you go away. But knowing how difficult it is, it is for some of the voters to get food, you can see that we're looking at them there. I would say they'll stay put until something happens or until these cheetahs leave. Jeff, uh, you are amazed that these cheaters have stayed on this kill for so long. Me too, but I tell you what, I think it was a hard work, it did, and she got cups, they will need to get it fed, and that one is trying to pull a bit of soil there, maybe to cover any smell going out. Cats have been known to do that, and we just try and dig some soil and cover that. And Zephyr is true. I mean, it's quite, it's quite some time. We've been here for an hour plus, and they have not, you know, moved, and they're still eating. So that's a clever cub. It's trying to cover the blood that have spilled there so that the smell doesn't go out there and it's not picked up, for example, by hyenas. How clever is that? See, I'm sure there's lipstick on her nose. Isn't that cool? Very clever. The other one is not bothered, just enjoying the rest there. But this one's trying to make sure we need to protect what the mother helped us bring down. And you can continue eating it. They have learned, I'm sure, maybe with previous experiences, once the smell is picked up out in the air, hyenas or, you know, lions or leopards will come and snatch their kill. So the best thing is to keep it discreet or cover it and it doesn't go out there to the world of the other predators. Quite active cub, this one, eh? Using both legs, one gets tired, changes to the other. And very nice, they're allowing the mother now to feed. They know the mother does a pretty good job. 
and going to seven, eight months, chances are this cup will definitely make it. Maybe it could be playtime now, who knows? Bone Crusher, great comment. They have a cute red nose, and maybe now you'll see them licking each other, and maybe the red nose Bone Crusher will go shortly. I tried to call it lipstick, but I doubt it's lipstick because Bone Crusher, the red is on the nose and not on the lips. And you can tell how worried they are. They very quickly look if they see something they cannot understand. Could be monkeys. But I would imagine now it could be the time now to start playing. I love drumming and reestablishing the bones as siblings. They're going back to the cave. The voyagers are trying to come down, as I said earlier. I seen, think I've seen two have come down by at two meters to a lower branch. But I think the mother doesn't look to her, be worried by that. And she keeps, or she continues eating. This is just an epic sight. And as I said earlier, I respect this female. I think she is pretty strong, she's pretty fast, and I would say very accurate in her hearts. I don't know how many she has failed before, or how many she has always succeeded in making them successful, but from the one she did last week of a young calf of a kudu, and now this fully grown, mature male impala, who I have a lot of respect, she commands a lot of respect for me. This could be a classical example of, I think, a female cheetah that can bring a young uh, wildebeest down. And Joe, you're asking, do cheetahs also scent mark? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And most for males, they also scent mark. And most for males, but not like the leopards. The leopards will do a lot of scent marking because they are territorial. And cheetahs are, in general, you know, will have huge home ranges and not keep in the same area for a long time. So yes, they do, but not like the leopards. It have one very characteristic spot. You see that spot there? I'm not sure, it's a little swollen, or it's a little unusual spot there. I want to use my binoculars and see whether it's a bit swollen, like a gland. And I haven't seen that, and it looks a little bit lighter than the rest of the body. Hopefully I have a chance to see it again. You see there, on the left cheek. And maybe this could be one of the things we might have to mark and be able to identify these cheetahs 100%, as much as they've been known by my colleagues. But I don't know whether anybody has picked that. I'm not sure is it kind of a tumor or swelling. And let's continue looking at it. Let's link or let's go to Steve and find out what he's doing on his walk. <laughs> well, we found a very interesting digging, and I get very excited when I find these because it is science in the bush of a honey badger. And you wonder how I can tell. Mainly it's because, first of all, if any of you've got a dog, especially a small type of dog, and you go to the beach, have you ever seen them dig a hole? They dig a hole in a circle. They dig down this way, this way, and then they lie down in it, and they dig this way, and then that way. And the honey badger was in here digging for, I'm not sure what exactly, but sometimes they're digging for, for um, I'm just going to break that. What is that? That's just a clump of soil. Sometimes they're digging for scorpions. Sometimes they're digging for dung beetles that are buried in with their larvae inside the balls. But this kind of hole is very likely from a scorpion. And they go in there because they can find the little keyhole. They can smell it. They know there's a scorpion and they know it's fresh. And they dig down until they can get in there. And it's amazing how deep that is. I mean, if I stick my arm in and put it down, it goes as far as above my wrist. Hang on. Up to there on my arm. So that is very, very deep in the ground. And... Um, that's how deep some of these scorpions can actually go. It's almost like a shoe or boot in the ground. They dig down and it goes at an angle. And this actually goes in at the side there. Yes, I'm sticking my hand into an unknown hole. I shouldn't be doing that. And we'll stop that right away. But I always like finding these because it's signs in the bush of honey badgers. And we don't see a lot of them. I do like seeing them, but we'll take what we can get. Um, and once again, I like talking about it. Disturbance. 
this little pod, this little seed pod had fallen in there. So there is a russet bush willow seed that's fallen in. And maybe with the wind and the movement of the soil, we're going to find that that um, basically turns into a tree at one stage. And that was all dug in by a honey badger. Isn't that marvelous? Disturbance in the bush is always very cool. Andy, I do believe there are wolverines and honey badgers. I do believe they are from the same, same sort of family. They do have... Well, originally they would have been somewhere very close to each other, and I think they've got a lot of similarities. Don't ask me to name those similarities, because I don't really know too much about Wolverine, but definitely the temperament, the temperament and sort of the aggressive nature that they both portray in the world is, puts them forward as that kind of individual. So I would love to actually go over to the Northern Americas to have a look at a Wolverine. He's also my favorite X-Men character, just by the way. <laughs> Those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. So Koki Franklin calling me. You probably can't hear it. He's going, Koki, Koki, Koki. First time I ever saw one was just a month ago. Very, very special. Always nice to get new birds to the list. When you start working in an area for a period of time, you sort of start running out of new bird species. And I've gotten at least three since I've been here. Well, it seems like Ralph has managed to get the drone up in the air, and I'm sure he has got the bird's eye view. Well, look at that, everybody. It is an absolutely beautiful view. We're here at Biffle's Hook Waterhole, and we've just put the drone up, the eye in the sky, and look at all those game paths coming down towards the water. That's us in the Land Rover there. As you now look over the water, you can just make out Scuba Steve there. I think he's uh, he's not used to this kind of thing, so he's just gone underwater. I'm sure he'll just poke his nostrils out in a minute. But we do put the drone up quite high, so it's not like it's bothering him too much. I'm just sure he's not quite sure what it is. So he'll just be playing it safe, sitting on the bottom of the water, or bottom of the dam there. And uh, while we haven't seen any sign of Tandy and uh, well we thought we'd just pop this up and you never know what we might find just keep looking around it's always amazing how the game paths converge down towards water and they get bigger and bigger and bigger it's almost like drainage lines um, that uh, lead down to water oh let's go to Dave exciting well the ball game might change here any minute now because I have seen another predator slowly creeping in here and I've seen a hyena who might want to come to these cheetahs and snatch their kill. You see I've been talking about other predators, hyenas, leopards and Very good. A very warm welcome to all of you, wherever you are in the world. We are in South Africa in the Greater Kruger National Park. My name is David and we are watching some cheetahs here having a kill and we've got a hyena who is trying to come close and steal this kill. The cheetahs have been enjoying this kill for the last one and a half hours without anybody with them. Vultures have been landing here but none of them had the courage to come down but we just saw a hyena coming in. Those are all the vultures. We have about 15 vultures of them together and we are finding out if the, that's the kill there. It's a mother with her two cubs and there's a hyena that tried to sneak in and they woke up and she did not go very far, I would say she's only about 50 meters from where these cheetahs are. So one of the cubs continue eating and the mother is might slowly come back. That's the hyena right there. She's looking and not very far. The only thing that may happen if more hyenas will come, then this will be the end of this delicious meal of these cheetahs here. So what the mother will want to do is to stand and keep an eye for, and what she is looking at is the direction. 
Chief Chil, you're saying you're glad they had a good meal before the hyena come. Yes, I agree with you. That's a great comment. And that's what happens with cheetahs. And you remember I was saying earlier, they have to eat very quickly. If they don't, they always face the challenge or the risk of the kill being snatched by bigger predators than them. Hyenas, lions, or leopards. So this particular case, we have been having vultures up there and look at her belly there. I mean, sorry, uh, the, she did not look very worried, but now with the coming of the hyena is a bit of a concern. So luckily they had eaten enough. I think I'm satisfied what they have eaten is not very bad. Jenny, your question is, is just one hyena? Yes, Jenny, is only one hyena, that one you see there. She was the first one to arrive and she's looking and what she'd be doing, she'd be looking or waiting to get reinforcement for them to come and wait away or try and intimidate these cheetahs to leave the kill. But Jenny, at the moment, it's only that one hyena and about 15 vultures up on top of the trees waiting to steal or take this kill over from this our cheetahs. Look at the caps there. They're slowly going towards the hyena. Maybe try and like to tell the hyena, come on, get out of here. Don't come for our food. This is our dinner. So they're slowly walking. And the hyena just standing her ground also. That's the hyena there. Look in the direction of the kill. Crisis, you're asking the hyena now, you're saying the hyena's not, not calling for help yet. What they would do, they should be very careful. They would want fast to eat on their own. You know, sometimes the hyenas are quite greedy. And the moment they call for more, what will happen? And the hyena's running away, by the way. What will happen? If they call for help, they'll have so many or very big numbers of them here. And that will not be fair for them. What she'd want to do is to sneak fast quietly on her own eat and once she is full then she can call for help but as it is now she is very quiet and waiting for her own opportunity to come and eat and the cabs are slowly going towards the direction of the hyena and the hyena turns and is walking away i don't know for how long this will continue you can see they're crouching or like stalking and towards the hyena I think what you need to do, Terry, you're saying, should we hear the hyena calling? Once that happens, we will definitely hear it calling. What we want to do, let us show you that exciting moment of the cubs trying to intimidate this very big hyena. So let's one minute and just change the position. That could be an exciting moment, seeing young cubs trying to let the hyena know, get out of here. This is our food, eh? Okay, just hold on for a second. They're too young to face the hyena, but again, Joel say, yes, the question is, is it dangerous for the cub? It is, because hyenas have been known to go for cubs and have eaten them. So it's quite dangerous, but if you look there, Joy, you can see two cubs one have laid down and the other one if you look carefully they are facing off with the hyena so the hyena is a bit to the left there yeah if you look carefully way to the left of your screen there top left right there well done Senzo that's the hyena that's where she is and look Volkab has stood up and the hyena has taken off it's gone Compare the sizes of these two predators here. This is a young cub, about seven, eight months, but the hyena also doesn't want to take any chances. She is alone, and these ones are three. And see how she makes herself to look very big. What I do not know in the hyena's mind is it able to tell this is a cheetah or a leopard. Crystal, I like your comment and you love just how the mother's watching because the mother has at one point let go and maybe when they're about 18 months a year and a half they'll be on their own she won't to have successful cubs and maybe generations later she'll know she trained them well rookie uh, Welcome, maybe you just joined us and a very big welcome, Rocky. We are very close to a camp next to us that's called Galago Camp, and that's exactly where this killing took place, about 20 meters 
inside that camp. You know, that's the fence for the camp, and it's called Galago Camp. And we're just next door to that camp. And some of the guests think they might have seen the cheetah chasing the impala. So they contacted us and we came here and they said, go look, we think, we think. They were Japanese and the English wasn't very good. So they're like, go look, we think, they kill, we think. So we came round and we just saw or found this cheetah mother with her two cubs enjoying the middle of an impala. Haina gone and the cub is just there making sure that he doesn't come back. The vultures haven't moved yet. So the cub, that one there, is facing the direction of the hyena. How exciting is this? They'll stay here as long as it takes until they're like granted they're full enough and that's the time they leave. But I'm sure if it gets much darker, they may want to leave and not want to risk facing off with hyenas or maybe leopards or lions in the darkness. We know cheetahs are very diurnal. They are better off, you know, doing their stuff during the day than at night. And I'm sure it could be easier for them to handle the situation in daylight. So if the hyena is gone, she thinks it's time to go back to the kill and start eating. This is very, very special. Cubs, you're not going to have a bit of a play or not yet, or you just ate, you need first the flight to settle in your tummies. Right, lay on the ground there, on the substrate, get the warmth. Even every time the vultures move up there, they'll turn and look. You can imagine the huge wingspan of the vultures, how loud it is. So any time they flap their wings, it causes them to worry. This is quite, quite, quite special. Very good, very exciting to have all of you, you know, joining us. And this is the stuff we see here in South Africa in the Greater Kruger National Park, specifically in the Juma Private Game Reserve. And we are so close to a camp here by the name of Galago. This is where the killing took place about two hours or two and a half hours ago. And this is quite magic. Right now we might be having some bird's eye view of this area. Well, look at that. And um, uh, that sounds very exciting, what was going on with those cheetah and hyena. Uh, it sounds quite similar to what was going on this morning. It seems like the hyena just never give up, even though they had quite a bit to eat this morning. And some of them already had very big fat bellies. But, um, well, back to what we're looking at at the moment. And Ferg, the excellent pilot here, is doing a wonderful job of giving us roundhouse view of this area near Biffles Hook waterhole and he's looking out over that uh, tree there with lots of nests in them as well oh we better go back to Dave there's all sorts happening there again well the hyena has said it's time to come back and it's right there now and he's still alone and that's the challenge now because when you know you have been outnumbered you don't stand a very good chance and it's a bit tricky for her to do anything until maybe she gets reinforcement from the other hyenas so she's slowly trying to creep back there and i do not know how far she will go without the others coming in to help so the cubs are laying down somewhere and they're looking at it and saying you try to come and you'll be in a lot of trouble you might hear some sound of another car and the friends of ours also come in to enjoy the sighting. So the hyena is right there and the cubs are just there on the ground looking at it. They're facing off, you know, face to face. You move and you'll be in a lot of trouble. The hyena isn't sure. It's trying to come in, the hyena. So 
seals think the hyena went to get reinforcement. I would have done that if, you know, I was the hyena. But, I mean, these are three cheetahs here, and you see how they make themselves speak, and they go in that angle, trying to, you know, give it, give the hyena a threat by laying down, putting their head down, and their ears on the back. And that's enough intimidation. Susie to the hyena and I agree with you the only thing the hyena should do now is go and get reinforcement anything more than two or three something might happen here but as long as she is alone I don't think he's going to get this kill she need to be a bit smarter and I do not know whether they do you know the ultra sound like elephants you know with very low frequencies to communicate with the other hyenas and like their usual way of doing things so they have to be very loud and that will give it away there it goes and she comes slowly and the cubs are going back to the kill and the hyena also walking in the same direction we'll just see what will happen here the vultures are building i think i thought we got uh, quite a good number but let's see this hyena what she exactly wants to do her belly to me looks fine very difficult to tell hyenas whether they're males or females from a distance. Unless, of course, you see two, and maybe being a male and a female, females being uh, bigger in size than the males. And she's making good ground, you know, towards the kill there. She's sniffing where the cubs have been laying so that she can pick anything. And that particular one is looking at some vivid monkeys, which are very vocal on the other side of the camp. That's the Galago Lodge. And it's down. They look now, they're fine, and they have relaxed. I like the cheetah being there, I mean the, the hyena being there. She needs surely to get some reinforcement. Crystal, do you think if the same hyena, I'd be happy? I never saw it. And uh, if her name is Koza and you think the same one that was the Hukumuri, then I think she is very vicious and very strong. She got very good senses of smell. And I think the, yeah, and I think the leopard the Hukumuri is a bit far from where we are. So let's just move in a different direction and see how the cheetahs are going to behave as she is getting closer to them, then it means she did not get enough food from Hukumuri's meal this morning. Just keep holding on. So are we good back there? Let's just turn around and see how it's going to play out here. And so long as she's alone, I don't think he's going to win a lot. This mother and two cubs will fight back. Let's go to Steve and find out how he's doing. Well, indeed, we are almost home. It is starting to get quite dark in the background. And uh, as it gets dark, obviously, safety becomes an issue. And here he is. You've been waiting to see him all afternoon. Herbie, there he is, my main man, back on the scene from leave. Nice one, Herbs. So we're going to be closing off from the bushwalk pretty soon while Ralph packs away his drone and David gets his lights all ready. How marvelous is it that he's not far away from here, hyena and cheetah interacting. I would have thought that the cheetah would have moved off straight away with the hyena approaching. But there we go. They don't all read the books. I've seen cheetah run away when vultures arrive because the vultures attract the other predators. I've seen it a couple of times. Now the vultures arrived, the hyena have arrived. Nonchalant, eh? The cheetah's doing their thing. So it's marvelous. We learn something new every single day. I wonder what David's thoughts are on that. I'm sure he's seen lots more of that up in the Mara. Um, I haven't seen too many cheetahs, to be honest, in my life. Ah, there they are. There are a few jackal. I actually had some tracks this morning and uh, yesterday, um, sort of in the western side. But I haven't, I've only seen jackal here twice. There's a very mangy looking jackal down around Chitwa who doesn't even look like a jackal if you look at him. He's got all the hair's gone, and then we've seen one on Sandy Patches it's with, uh, to our western side. And when we saw him, he bolted like the devil himself was behind him. And jackal are a, a very nice food for leopard. Lion will chase them. But um, I don't know, it's just not quite the sort of habitat for jackal. But they are around. They do move. 
but we haven't seen many in my time. Craig, how many jackal have you seen here? A few. You've seen a few. Definitely just not the right habitat. More open areas. They need dense sites, they need burrows. They also want to be able to see. So quarantine here, which is quite open, would be quite a good area for jackal. But I think there's just so many leopard in the area that uh, the jackal numbers are quite low. Uh, but we see tracks only from time to time. So very sort of scarce animal seen in the wilderness here. Yeah? But from myself and Craig and the Bushwalk team, it's been a marvelous afternoon. Seems as Craig, uh, seems as uh, Ralph is back in the vehicle. Let's go and say our last farewells to him. Well, goodbye, Steve, and see you in the morning. Well, I'll see you back at camp, but uh, for the viewers, yeah, it's that time of the evening. Uh, as we always say, once that sun has set, you need to be heading back towards camp or your vehicle or whatever it is when you're out on foot. So that's the time. Not safe to be out in the dark, but it is safe for us, and we're just leaving Biffle's Hook waterhole now we're going to be on the lookout now for all sorts hoping that we can get some nightlife going here and uh, i think i'm going to head down the biffles hook cut line and maybe do a little bit of a, a aubrey's road maybe gallego shortcut and just the zigzag a little bit um, because often that's where shadulu likes to hang around so maybe we'll um, be able to find one of the leopards or predators. Speaking of predators, well, Dave, he's had a wonderful uh, afternoon with the cheetah, but let's go back to him. Yes, this is one of my best afternoons, and uh, yeah, hanging around the Buffer's Hawk waterhole, you might see anything coming to drink some water there, Ralph, but now these cheetahs have not gone to drink water and see them to eat and to eat. I think this could be one of the longest sightings I've ever seen of cheetahs eating non-stop. They've been eating, eating, and it's one of, you know, it's one of the cubs they are eating, and they haven't stopped eating. And you notice now we have definitely gone to IR to make sure we do not invade their space or affect their behavior by any chance or shining any bright light on them. We do not want to expose them also to the hyena, which we think, or I think, is still lurking around, waiting for an opportunity for these cheetahs to make a move. Tesla, how are you today? And thank you so very much for joining us and make sure you'll be joining us every day two times when we do these safari drives. And your question is, how old are these cubs? Uh, my guess, Tesla, they're about seven or eight months. We think they were born last year in the month of October or November. So they could be anything seven to eight months. And Tesla, they will stay with the mother until they're able to hunt for themselves. Even when they get to about 15 months, they can always chase small rabbits, small scrub hares, small baby antelopes, something like that. They'll chase them, catch them, but they'll not be able to kill them. But by the time they're about 18 months or about one and a half years, that time they'll be good to go and the mother will tell them goodbye. So, yeah, they're about seven or eight months old. So they're just watching one or the other one eating, but up in there they're also looking at some vultures. But none of the vultures have made an attempt to come down. Look at those eyes there that could be look very different if you compare them to leopards at night. And you can see the pupils of the eyes at night, they tend to dilate, they tend to look a little bigger than during the day for them to see better. And Tesla, if you're still watching and this is your very first time again, I want you to look very carefully on the face of these cheetahs and you'll notice they got two black lines from the eyes to their mouth. And they're like what sometimes you call tear marks. I'm not sure she's having a nap snoozing. So Tesla, that's one big difference between cheetahs and leopards. So the cheetahs will have those two black lines from the eyes to the mouth. Leopards do not have them. Of course, the other difference will be the spots on them, and leopards will have what we call rosettes or bigger dots combined together. 
or the mother. I'm not sure she's having a snooze from the kill. Sorry, I didn't mean to be loud. Or it's because she has eaten so much. I think she's justified now to have a snooze. I would wonder why they have taken rather long to go for a drink, having eaten so much. We have a few pounds around this area, and I'm sure at one point they'll go. The hyena must have disappeared, or staying there hoping these cheetahs will leave, because the hyenas, I'm sure they know out of experience, after some time the cheetahs will make a move, either go for a drink or just leave the kill. Marie Ellen, you're asking because there are not as many cheetahs in Juma. Maybe the hyenas are unsure how to deal with cheetahs. I would agree. I mean, I would think that's a possibility. Because if you happen to watch our morning drive uh, today, I think the hyenas here have known the leopards. And they came straight to Hukumuri and they were trying to snatch the kill. I think you have a point there. It could be a possibility. And earlier, when you were watching that hyena facing off with the cubs, the cubs are too small. You'd compare the size of Hukumuri. Hukumuri is such a huge boy, big male, and you know the hyenas you know went head on, they like went for him. But these two cubs have been able to intimidate the hyena and the hyena backtracked and took off. So yeah, I think you have a point there. It could be a possibility. They are not sure what you know cheetahs can do to them. Something tells me these three cats now are very well fed. Angie, will vultures eat at night? Angie, I'll tell you a big yes, a big yes. And depending on how it will play out with the hyenas, as soon as these cheetahs live here, the vultures will be the first one to land here. And then what will count is how many hyenas against the vultures. But if the vultures will outnumber the hyenas, the vultures will keep the kill. Yes, uh, at night the vultures will eat comfortably. Staying together now trying to rebound and I can tell you I highly doubt they'll go to that kill again but we are yet to see we'll just keep waiting and see how they behave because they might decide to go a quick a quick one more bite before they give it up let's find out what Ralph is searching for at the moment well I'm just searching for anything and everything little chameleons maybe on a on a red bush willow or any genets around maybe a leopard maybe a civet maybe a white-tailed mongoose um, oh well if we're lucky we might see a lion or a leopard but those are just bonuses I also like looking for the smaller chaps uh, maybe a, an odd night jar be nice to see uh, something like a pennant winged nightjar. They wouldn't be in breeding plumage at the moment, so it's quite difficult to tell if it's, uh, uh, you know, between the nightjars at the moment when they're not uh, in breeding plumage. Most easy way to tell between nightjars is their call, but we could also see any of the owls, little barred owlet or white-faced scops or these African scops um, or the pearl spotted or even a barn owl, any of the owls really, it'd be nice to see one of them. I saw a very owl a couple of times. Now James, you say that it's World Otter Day. That's very interesting. Now, I used to run, which is Hannesburg, and it leads into which is one of the favorite of Yes, the cheetahs are not moving as yet. What they have done, they have just relocated from the kill. 
and now they're enjoying the warmth again of the substrate it's much warmer where they are than the grass and again you can see clearly the fence of our neighboring camp here the galago lodge where the killing happened maybe now would say going to two and a half hours and that one cab in the background there is looking on the direction of the hyena and apologies for the gremlin slayer with rough uh, it was a technical hitch sometimes these things will happen but i got lots of excitement to be sitting with these cheetahs in this long quite unusual to see them you know eating for so long and also even after i would guess getting full they are not leaving these killers yet they are here to stay as I said earlier, I respect this particular female, and definitely, if you know these cabs will be the same lineage, I see they have, you know, they'll have a lot of uh, future, a lot of success in the future days for themselves, having such a great mother. So she's looking in the direction of the hyena. Christine, that's a very good question. How big is quarantine fast? Let me try and calculate. Is it about 200 meters, 200 meters? I would give it about 500 square meters or maybe 800 square meters. I don't think quarantine would be enough for them. I highly doubt. And you know, cheetahs do not have territories like leopards. Cheetahs have home ranges and sometimes their home ranges are huge. You know, anything from 30 or about a thousand hectares so I doubt quarantine would be enough for them and they will need to have enough food but that particular area of quarantine I'm sure you know we'll always see a lot of impalas there once in a while you've seen uh, wildebeest or zebras so the impala is what they'll be going for but I highly doubt that is enough space for them they will need much bigger area than that and once the prey get to know we have those you know predators around there they tend to relocate so that's why cheetahs will need to leave quarantine and wait until the prey is back then they'll come and sneak on them again so quarantine is such a nice area you know it's very open and it's more like a mini savanna i would call it but yeah they must have done very well to bring this impala down in this kind of thickets Cheetahs have been known to adapt depending on the habitat they find themselves in. It's time to have a nap. Very typical, you know, even like human beings. If you're given a chance after such a heavy meal, you tend to doze off. Look at that one, how sweet. All right, rough. The gremlins are over and he is back and active. So, like I was saying, everybody, the Clip River, which Clip meaning stone, the stony river, um, where I grew up, uh, my folks, actually, my parents lived on the banks of the river. So I grew up uh, driving boats around and camping and doing all sorts on the river itself. And that's a tributary of the Vaal River, which is a tributary in turn of the Orange River, which uh, drains one third of South Africa. So it's a, it's a rather large uh, system in its entirety and a wonderful freshwater system. It always has been. Um, and growing up, we always used to, uh, I, I was never sure as a youngster, I used to find all, the, all this scat along the banks and it often had a lot of um, crab shells in it and I never knew what it was. And later, we used to uh, keep... Oh, I'm um, just spotting eyes. I think it's antelope. Um, but um, later, when I was fishing in my boat, we often had these very rare fleeting encounters of, um, while I was just busy fishing, I would, I would think it's either a cat or a dog coming towards us in the water. And um, I'd, I'd seen it many times. And then, obviously, as I grew older and I started to realize all the different kinds of uh, wildlife and stuff that we got around, um, 
then I, I worked out what an otter looked like and then I managed to identify them um, and we, we actually saw quite a lot of them but because of the amount of time I used to spend fishing um, with my friend it was one friend in particular you know it, it got to the point where um, actually my mom used to I used to get into lots of trouble for doing all sorts of things not not uh, stupid uh, um, things but well it was it was stupid things in, in the sense that it was never about alcohol or girls or that kind of things we just, just used to get up to nonsense um, and um, I, I used to get grounded by my mom but the one bonus was that she always used to for some reason allow me to go fishing and I had my boat and I could pretty much go anywhere from my boat I could get into town because I used to drive down the river and then sneak up somebody else's property and go into town if I wanted to so I pretty much had freedom um, even when I was grounded which, uh, which uh, I, I'm not going to tell my children that but there, what is that? There we've got a Janet. He's just coming down the branch there. Don't be scared. Don't be scared, little one. It's like a small spotted Janet. He was probably just coming out of his hole in the tree. And just see the side of him. I can't start up and move to get a better view on him because he will most likely just disappear. And genets, like the warthogs, they can become quite tame, especially around campsites or lodges. This one now starting to make his way down. You very often find their tracks all over the road. So they make their homes in these hollow trees, but they do then spend a large part of the evening running around on the ground and looking for all sorts from from um, insects to you know whatever even mice they'll catch mice but they'll also um, around lodges and that they will raid dustbins especially organic waste they'll get stuck into that but now that's probably the last we'll see of him so Yes, uh, anyway, I got a little bit sidetracked there, but um, I have seen quite a few uh, otters in my life, to answer your question, Richard, because of my um, sort of fishing habits. And any fishing that might be. That was an awesome genet sighting, everybody. I'm not quite sure. He's probably run off into the bush over there. So... And we'll leave him be. They're quite shy little creatures. Monica, yes, uh, it's not very often that you get to see them out of the tree, hey? Um, and as I say, very shy animals, much like that of the otters. The otters are extremely shy animals. And um, Ferg was actually just telling me a story down at Cape Point, um, where he went for a walk. Uh, Cape Point is obviously a nature reserve that's right at the tip of Africa, tip of South Africa. And uh, it's a protected nature reserve there. And he went for a little walk uh, down bouldering on the rocks. And it was like a little bit of a safe haven, a secret spot that he found. And there was a Cape Clawless otter sunning itself, lying on its back. And uh, he sat and watched it for about five minutes. And this thing then eventually opened its eyes and saw that Ferg was there and got the fright of its life and dived back into the water. So... They're very, very secretive, don't like to be seen, and as soon as they are, you normally don't see them again. They disappear under the water, and they're gone. But they do frequently, their, their biggest food is freshwater crabs. And here we've got a couple of scrub hares. You can just have a look at these guys. Okay, we're going to go over into IR now, which is the infrared or night vision. There we go. And I can drop the spotlight. And then we can let them be very natural because as soon as the light is on them, I just want to drop that light. As soon as the light is on them, as you've seen, especially when they're on the road, they very much get confused by the light. And they normally follow it. But uh, there are so many of these scrub hairs, it's good that they are 
in big numbers because they do form quite a lot of food for different animals. These two have now disappeared off into the grass, so let's, uh, let's continue on our way to see what else we can find. There we are. Okay, so while we do a little bit of a loop and see what else is maybe just lurking, who knows, maybe there's a, a leopard here, um, but let's go back to those cheetah with Dave. Even these cheetahs, when they're uh, this young, they may be playing with small little scrub hairs, like, you know, what we're seeing now in the night, and they'll keep coming out in the darkness. But it's funny how they take rather long before they can start killing or being able to bring down food for themselves. Even at the age sometimes of a year plus, they can be chasing scrub hairs, they can be chasing fawns or young ones of antelopes. But they only catch them and they are not able to kill them, What sometimes the mothers have been known to do. For, for example, that youngster there, she will go, do a hunt and, you know, catch a prey, subdue it, and maybe not kill it, and then bring it home alive and then bring it to the youngsters to play with it. And then they keep chasing it and the mother just watches. And even when they're about 15 months, very few cheetahs have seen or have known that they can comfortably go for a kill and bring a prey down and even kill it. They'll catch it and they'll not be able to, you know, suffocate it or kill it until maybe when they go to about a year and a half. That time independently, they can like, you know, be able to survive on their own. Very full at the moment and not doing much action. I'm trying to imagine the hyenas we saw in the morning is the one hyena that we saw did it. Is, it. is it looking for reinforcement? Is it calling the others? Or what could be happening? We haven't seen her come back. And hopefully she doesn't surprise us by sneaking when you're not watching and pulls the kill away. We've been watching the kill. The kill is still where it was. Says, so can you see the kill? Yes, that's the horn right there. Excuse me. Hyenas have been known to be very sneaky. That's the male impala you can see, or what used to be a nice male impala. And these are the animals at the scene of crime. To your surprise, the hyenas have not come in and they chased the leopard. And we had this debate a few minutes earlier that maybe we, without not having as many, say, the hyenas not seeing as many cheetahs, maybe they have not been able to understand what type of animals or they do not know the potential danger of the cheetahs and they can't maybe face them off. Well, I would guess that could be a bit of a theory. It could be possible. But yes, where are these hyenas? The drama they had this morning with Hukumori, who was a bigger, you know, a bigger cat and quite strong, that was something unusual. But here we had just one hyena, sneaks in, looks, tries to come close, and two small, teeny seven, eight months cub, wed, you know, her off and she's gone, I think. This is bringing a lot of uh, debate, and I don't know what you viewers think, but my feelings are either the hyenas are too full from where they are from this morning, or they haven't known that there's a kill around this area, and if they know, definitely they'll come in big numbers. Where the one is at the moment, I can't see it. I don't know where it is. She might have gone to call, but normally hyenas will not have that actual sound calling, and they go, Ooh. And in general, that's done by the males more than the females, and they start calling each other to come and enjoy this feast. But as it is now, status quo, the cheetahs are where they are, and if you look carefully, there's one that had just popped her head up and then put it down. <laughs> Paula, I mean, Paula, definitely. I mean, you are, you're not wrong, Paula. I mean, the, the, the cheetahs will not do a lot of bone breaking, go to the skull, go to the hooves, you know. Paula, you're absolutely right that the cheetah, I mean, the hyena will steal it over it. Definitely. At one point, these cheetahs definitely will wake up, leave, and most likely go for a drink. And as they do that, Paula, the hyena will come. 
will definitely come and take the impala. I'm talking of an impala down here. I think Raf has some live impala. Well, yes, we do. And I always like to spend a bit of time, especially with this infrared or night vision um, with impala, because it's, um, it's amazing to watch them. Uh, you know, in the dark. We don't often get to do that because we'd have to be putting the light on them, stunning them, and then it's not very ethical to watch them. But with this night vision, it's nice to see how they can still operate, but they do get very edgy at night. And, and of course, you would understand why, because every single predator around here is trying their luck to try and uh, kill them and eat them. So, shame. It's, uh, it's pretty much... Uh, uh, you know, every single evening is like playing Russian roulette. Who's going to be eaten? And they do need to try and bunch up together, try and keep all the eyes and ears working together. And, well, if I was an impala, I would, uh, I think I would have a nervous wreck because um, it's, they've got to spend the whole night on their toes and just wondering which direction the predator is going to come from. So it's it's quite incredible that uh, they are still sane because I think I would be insane. And there's the male running in the background, obviously trying to rein in some of the girls that have disappeared off. There he is. Trying to tell them off, come on, come back. And also, it's probably a good thing that the male does that, reining them in, because it probably helps for that predation in specific keeping them all together because if you're on your own in the middle of the dark you don't have others looking out for you so easier for you to get eaten now GW yeah it's very relaxing to watch and they seem they seem relaxed but um, you know they are highly alert to any noise or movement and as I say I'm going to try and move forward slightly just so we can get a little bit closer to them okay while well, I get closer to these impala so we can hang with them a little bit um, of course we'd have to go back to those cheetah well the cheetahs have risen up they, I think they might have been spoked by a movement of something not sure it was the hyena or not but they're standing up now like to get out of here and maybe go for a drink but then they stopped again and one cub has laid down there I don't think they are yet ready for a drink but chances are I doubt they'll go back to the kill. They may want to stay here keeping a guard on it, but surely from the size of those bellies, they're done with it. Maybe it could be some time for play. Boarding a bit. Two youngsters there. How sweet is that? And definitely they're licking each other. You know, the blood where the tongues of either of them cannot reach. Isn't that not clever? Scratch my back, I scratch yours. Sam, would you agree? Yes, yeah, so I think so. Scratch my back, I scratch you. As you can't have a tongue, you know, stretching out over the way to the forehead or to the nose or below the neck. So we need to do for each other. I was talking earlier where mothers have been known to lick uh, the cubs, you know, who have to kill but much younger cubs than these ones. But I think these ones are doing a good job and they're learning for themselves. And this, of course, strengthens their bones. As a family, or two brothers, or brother and a sister, or two sisters, I'm not sure what sex they are. And the mother is just enjoying them, and like, well done, that's the way to go. Yvon thinks this is very sweet. It is really sweet after having such a great meal and time to look at that. Is that wonderful? Yes, I agree. It's very sweet, as you said. Let's go back to Raf and see what the impalas are doing. Well, these impala are just doing a little bit of grooming and they've got very specific teeth that assist for that uh, particular grooming that you just saw them doing there. And they also exhibit aloe grooming 
do impala so they groom each other as well and there's a little bit of that going on and they are moving now onto quarantine which is a nice open space and I always think that um, the impala, the wildebeest, the zebra and even the giraffe they like moving on to this open space because I think they, they feel a little bit more comfortable in that they might be able to see predators coming a bit easier because it seems to be an, a, a sort of a daily routine. Just after sunset they all start to move up and almost a mini migration up to quarantine here as you see this male once again coming in trying to rein all these girls in and if we listen you can hear a little bit of their vocalizations as well. It's gone a little bit soft now, but there's quite a bit of... It's actually quite similar to Springbok, but they do it a little bit louder in that general communication. they got a... Oh, there we go. There's a little bit. He's a very good-looking male, isn't he? Well, he's got a big job on his hands. He's got to look after these females through the night. He won't be chased by cheetah, I don't imagine. Not tonight, anyway. But he could be chased by lion and leopard. So you can hear this... It almost sounds a bit like a burp. Marcy, thanks for the compliment. What an epic drive once again. Well, we've all tried our little bit. And, uh, well, that's the bush, the beauty of the bush. It always throws different things at you every single time. And we are slowly starting to head towards the end of the drive now as we just watch these impala starting to shift around there and well it's been another fantastic drive as Marcy, Marcy says um, well we found our uh, beautiful uh, sighting this morning with Hukumuri and those hyena and it seems like uh, it repeated itself with the cheetah and and the hyenas as well and I can just hear a little bit more over there I wonder if Ferg can see those impala but thanks once again to all the crew uh, in the FC Thanks to the guides and thanks for all the viewers, of course, you, the viewers, uh, without you this wouldn't be possible. And of course, thanks to the wildlife that is out here. And don't forget to join us tomorrow once again. And good night and goodbye, everyone. See you later.